I mean, this seems very necessary. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome. Um, I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Clerk, will you call the roll? Agent. Here. Allie Burton. Here. Amy Keith. Here. Yeah. Here. Here. Weddings. Here. All present. Thanks. Um, we're going to all have Courtney walk through the schedule. And then um, before we jump into budget slides, I've got a couple things to say. Good morning, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I am Courtney Washburn. I am the chief of staff for the city and I um, am going to be your bookend for the day. So I'll start with the overview and then um, I'll be at the end of um, the day to answer any um, follow-up um, questions or um, any pieces of feedback that remain. Um, so first and foremost, just a reminder of the mission of the city. Um, I like to um, point this out. It is the thing that unites all of the staff who work for the city of Boise, including the directors uh, we have with us today. Um, many, many people work to deliver service throughout the city and also work to put together the budget. So a special shout out to Eric, who you'll hear from later, and Christine uh, Miller, who were the drivers of putting together today's presentation along with the um, department directors. And so what we're doing today, oh, sorry, I keep seeing myself instead of my slides. Um, the budget process overview, you have done the budget overview. Today we're doing the first um, city council budget workshop. And the goal of today is to get through all of the um, resource requests by the department and to gather your questions, your concerns, your compliments, you're allowed to compliment. Uh, city staff as well, and feedback for follow-up so that we can get you all the information you need while we build the budget. Um, we will not be presenting you with all the detailed information associated uh, with each of these requests because that is what the budget book is for, um, but we will be giving you an overview of where the departments are heading and what um, they're hoping um, to see in that budget book. So um, we have uh, folks in the room here to capture your questions, concerns, compliments, and feedback. And um, in order to get through the day efficiently, um, you may hear directors uh, commit to a follow-up for information. Um, or if there's a question we can't currently answer, um, just know we will return with those um, in whatever form working with council leadership determines is the most appropriate. Um, we'll return to the slide at the end just to remind you that this is the first of several interactions um, you will have with the city's budget. And then our goal for the day is to get through um, presentations from all of the departments and then the office of the city council. Um, we do have several other offices that will not be presenting today because there are no budget asks. That includes the mayor's office, uh, the office of um, community engagement, the office of police accountability, and your office of internal audit. Um, so the reason those won't be covered is because there are no additional budget asks um, in this year's cycle. And so we're going to start with Eric to give an overview of um, the budget strategy and approach. And then we're going to break this down by departments. And then um, you're going to break for lunch in your new meeting. Um, and then when you after you complete the new meeting, um, we'll continue um, with the departments. Um, we've got a couple of special guests today because we've got directors who are out of town. Um, Carrie is going to um, cover the slides for human resources and Kelsey is going to do the ones for the fire department. Um, and then we'll wrap up the day towards the end. With that, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Courtney. I first want to thank all of um, our team for being here today and for the, all the work that went into this to lead up to it. Um, so thanks. Thanks so much. Look forward to the conversation. You know, I, as I said in my state of the city, um, our vision is to be a safe and welcoming city for everyone. Um, and the budget document is really reflective and ought to be and, and must be reflective of the values of this community, um, which is what we seek to do with this budget. And so the goals today um, and with this budget and through this conversation today to get ready for the budget workshop um, is to, with this work, to make sure that we're investing in and the needs of today, 
um, while investing for the future and also ensuring that we are able to continue to make good on our promise to provide as much relief as possible to residents while making sure that we can meet today's needs and prepare for the future. Um, and ultimately it's about taking care of people. So um, both making investments for and with our residents through the departments that we um, lead, but also taking care of our staff. And so there's in here um, information about raises building on our, our desire to have a true merit pool, pool um, but then increasing parental leave and looking at vacation as well for our employees. Um, and so just some highlights, all the departments are here, um, but you'll see in today's discussion, um, some provisional items in the event the council pa passes the modern zoning code, um, there will be some budget items. Uh, we are um, continuing to take and invest housing dollars in um, housing solutions for residents. And so there's a discussion around that. Of course, uh, some parks and a new pathways fund that I wanted to highlight, um, as well as the electrification, continued electrification of some of our buildings through public works. And um, with that, I will head, hand it back over. Eric's going to do a, an overview. We, and I want to thank the county assessor. Um, her team was able to get to us yesterday some new information that enables us today to have a conversation about the real impacts of the change in valuation strategy she's using, so um, re relief for our residents, but also the real impact that our decision, again, to keep money in the hands of taxpayers will have on the average homeowner. Um, Madam Mayor, I'm just going to cover a couple themes um, and some um, overall um, information contained in this budget before handing it over to Eric to go through um, the um, strategy and approach to the budget build. Um, these should look very, very familiar to you. Um, the themes are of this budget are to advance community priorities. That includes housing, climate, transportation, economic opportunity, and health and safety. And these aren't just the priorities of individual um, departments or offices. These are the concerted efforts that the city um, brings its best and brightest together to tackle. Uh, some of the considerations um, providing property tax relief, uh, which has been a priority of the mayor and the council. Um, we obviously need to keep pace with growth and we need to ensure um, that we continue the service delivery our residents expect. And then some of the highlights in this budget, um, we need to continue our efforts um, to protect and expand on affordable housing. You all should be aware of the investment we're making in emergency shelter as we're waiting for some of our other projects to come online. Um, we do have in this budget the bridge funding for Valley Regional Transit um, with a caveat, uh, Valley Regional Transit will bring to you um, that request and that public hearing on June 6th. Um, and then the pending um, approval of the modern zoning code implementation is also um, in this budget. Um, we are proposing to add new positions and as the mayor mentioned, increase um, compensation and benefits for our employees. And then increasingly, as we work um, to deliver services to the community, finding ways to do it better, quicker, faster has become a priority. So streamlining processes, um, investing in technology, and really focusing on data collection and quality, particularly um, as it relates to what might be useful in decision-making moving forward. And then as you all probably know, several of our departments are in strategy or planning processes that includes um, facilities and um, strategic plans in addition to a technology roadmap. Um, and this uh, continues to be a theme and has been for very uh, quite a few years since um, we fully recovered uh, from the pandemic. So um, Idaho's population growth continues to increase. Um, our valley continues to grow and um, the city continues to be in a growth pattern. And um, the city remains the state and the valley's economic driver and cultural center with more and more people coming um, to live, work and play. 
And then I just want to touch on um, the general fund staffing growth trends in FY 2017 to 2020. Before COVID, um, the average add of positions was 28 per year. And then in 2022 and 2023, we needed to catch up because um, we did not expand during um, the pandemic because we were uncertain um, what service delivery we were going to provide and the staffing we would need to provide it. Um, so we added roughly 47 positions um, during that period of time. And then in the budget that will come before you, we're proposing 26.75 positions, which we're um, calling a return to normal. And these are really targeted investments um, in public safety, in addition to um, actions of the city that are budget neutral. So here is the breakdown. So the green is just a reminder of our positions um, in the enterprise funds that do not rely on um, general funds for support. Um, these numbers um, are probably not a surprise given the growth in the airport and um, in public works associated with expanded um, water renewal and solid waste needs of the city. And then the positions break down um, by department I believe um, this is the first time in a long time the city council is proposing to add FTEs. So you'll see these on here. And then the largest investment in terms of staffing is in the police department. And those positions um, are mainly focused on the need to invest in training, leadership development, um, and the growth um, of our police department, not just in numbers, but in um, modernizing some of our approaches and um, investing in the training of officers. And then in terms of employee compensation, we obviously wanna retain our talented team, um, stay competitive in the marketplace. So our proposed approach for general employees is 3.5% base increase. Um, the city has worked really hard to separate cost of living from um, merit-based pay, and this is reflective of that. So the base increase um, is should be considered more of the cost of living in the city, and the 3% merit one time um, is designed to reward people for um, their performance in the positions. Um, we continue to maintain no and low cost health care insurance for our employees and their families. And then we are proposing to enhance leave benefits by extending parental leave and um, adding to vacation accrual. And then new benefits, um, our new adoption benefit. And then um, if we have staff who are bilingual and we're gonna start with Spanish and that adds to um, their job. So um, we're gonna look through job classes that may benefit from um, bilingual um, staff, there will be um, an incentive added to um, that person's pay as a result of the um, skill they bring. And with that, Madam Mayor, unless there are any questions, I will hand it over to Eric. Good morning, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, I'm Eric Galamorio with the Department of Finance and Administration. I'm gonna go over some uh, themes uh, before going into a little bit of specifics uh, in terms of what this budget contains. Um, the first theme uh, in developing uh, the proposed fiscal year 24 budget uh, was first and foremost fiscal responsibility. So um, in developing this, it was very important to ensure that not only uh, was the general fund balanced in fiscal year 24, uh, and that's per state code, um, but also balanced uh, it within our forecast period. And when we, we develop our forecast, we look at a 10-year time horizon. So uh, we, we believe that this budget will be balanced uh, and allow for the city to be in a uh, positive position within that entire forecast period. 
Similarly, we looked at our capital fund and strove to ensure that our capital fund would be balanced uh, within the five-year horizon that we, we look at within our capital fund. Uh, to do that, we, you know, we're, we worked very hard to ensure that our revenue targets uh, were achievable, uh, as were our expenditure budgets uh, realistic, uh, that any additions uh, are sustainable over time as well as uh, ensuring that there are allowances for future growth, uh, you know, to keep up with community uh, community growth. As we developed uh, the recommendations included within this budget, uh, we also made certain allowances for a potential recession, should we experience one. Uh, the first element that we included uh, to that end was the uh, establishment of an economic uncertainty reserve. Uh, $500,000 is included within this budget for that, uh, and that could be available for any unexpected uh, costs that we might realize or any unexpected revenue declines. Uh, further, we looked at our revenue estimates within uh, development fees and departmental revenues. Those are two categories that tend to be the most uh, economically sensitive, and in looking at those categories, we did uh, you know, try to restrain restrain growth um, uh, to prepare if we should see any reductions. We also know that we're seeing, uh, you know, very high inflation levels uh, in the city and, and nationally. Um, and we really worked hard to ensure that this budget was reflective of cost increases. Um, so within our capital plan, several of our projects have been uh, have been adjusted. We also have uh, an approach to address as address escalation, which I'll go over in just a couple of moments. We've accounted for uh, anticipated increase increases in uh, high growth areas such as software, uh, insurance, and fuel. As both the mayor and Courtney mentioned. Uh, property tax relief is a component of this, uh, really a central component of this budget. Um, the recommendation included herein is a 2% uh, base growth uh, for property tax as opposed to the 3% uh, max. Um, the impacts of House Bill 292 uh, still are yet to be quantified. There are uh, numerous factors that will go into that, but I will be able to share um, what the impact on the average homeowner would be um, as a result of this 2% decision absent uh, House Bill 292. That 2% base growth places average growth uh, on property taxes since the beginning of the pandemic at 1.86% uh, and providing cumulatively 7.5 million in total uh, base property tax relief. Finally, uh, on property taxes, this, this budget includes the continuation of the very successful uh, property tax rebate program uh, that we uh, first instituted as part of the current fiscal year. 1.2 million was allocated uh, the current fiscal year and additional 1.2 million is proposed for fiscal year 24. Looking at uh, the allocation of general fund revenues uh, proposed for fiscal year 24, you can see property tax makes up approximately 60% um, of overall general fund revenues. Looking back to fiscal year 23, that number was approximately 57%, uh, but that could be a little bit misleading. The reason that you see the growth from 57 to 60 is that in fiscal year 23, there were uh, higher carryover amounts that were included as part of this budget, as well as uh, a high degree of federal proceeds, which have already been recognized associated with ARPA. Um, so, so therefore, some of those one-time resources aren't there in this year, which has driven up percentages in some of the other categories. Looking at uh, the next few uh, slices of the pie, departmental revenue makes up about 12 and a quarter percent. Uh, that would be things like our service contracts for police and fire services, recreation uh, services provided our, by our Parks and Recreation Department, and uh, various other departmental uh, provided services. 
sales tax at just under 9% and development fees at just over five. Looking at the uh, departmental expenses proposed for fiscal year 24, public safety again comprises uh, just over half of the uh, general fund budget at 50.8%. The next largest slice of the pie at 16.6% is um, HR, IT, finance, and legal. And I'll note uh, for those departments, while they are uh, support in nature, there, there are uh, public facing elements within, uh, within those departments. Think things like uh, code enforcement, animal enforcement, front counter, uh, and in certain criminal prosecution services. Our Parks and Recreation Department makes up uh, just under 11% of the proposed fiscal year 24 budget. And you can see the other slices of the pie there uh, right around 5%. Courtney uh, talked about the uh, position adjustments recommended as part of uh, the fiscal year 24 package. Again, 26.75 uh, positions, which is more of a return to a, a normal growth level. As you look at those 26.75 positions, uh, just under half, 45% of those are uh, allocated towards public safety uh, for our fire and police departments. A third of those positions are dedicated towards other external uh, facing uh, services, things like our parks and recreation department, our library, um, in our planning and development services departments. 17% uh, of the uh, proposed FTEs uh, dedicated towards internal functions uh, within legal department of finance and uh, IT. And then the one and a half positions proposed for uh, city council support. Looking at ways that we were able to um, to make the investments included in this budget possible, there was really a whole slate of, of things uh, and approaches that were employed. The first one is a continuation of the approach that we uh, have included the past two fiscal years, which is pre-planning on savings from the current fiscal year. Um, so as we look at fiscal year 23, uh, right now we're planning on approximately 6.9 million in unallocated resources which has been recommended to be carried forward into uh, fiscal year 24. Secondly, uh, and we went over this a little bit uh, at the budget overview a few weeks back, there is a new approach recommended for uh, vacancies. We continue to experience higher level than the normal uh, vacancies. Uh, and we are trying to proactively plan for that and include that as part of our budget so as to uh, more proactively uh, allocate those savings as part of the budget process. Uh, in terms of our service contracts and our cost recovery levels, uh, there's been a concerted effort by our fire department and by our police department to ensure that um, our partners are paying the full cost of uh, services uh, for what we are providing for them. Primarily that includes uh, our indirect costs. There was uh, some maintenance and operations or non-personnel cuts and right sizing that were included as part of uh, this package. Each department was given a 1.5% uh, reduction target for their maintenance and operations budget of which we considered half of that to be uh, ongoing. So the savings uh, for fiscal year 24 are just over a half a million dollars for, uh, from that strategy and about $260,000 ongoing was realized from that approach. There previously existed a off cycle uh, personnel adjustment allocation. That allocation was available to address things like reclassifications or uh, you know, changes in uh, the composition of uh, already authorized FTE count. Uh, there has been a really concerted effort to drive those discussions and those decisions into the budget. Um, so that 
off cycle uh, allocation has been eliminated as part of this budget. Sales tax, um, we are still forecasting 1% growth for fiscal year 24. We don't anticipate getting the full statewide growth. But what we have been able to recognize is uh, growth that was realized in fiscal year 2022. And it was not built into fiscal year 2023 because uh, we didn't know if we were gonna get it at the time the current year's budget was developed. Uh, that growth is based on the way that the state does its distribution formula is base. So we've been able to build in that, that uh, increased sales tax revenue as part of this budget. We have increased, and, and this is a one-time revenue, but we have increased our estimate for uh, interest earnings um, attributable to rising interest rates um, and also attributable to you know, some of those vacancy savings that I was referring to earlier. And then we've looked at uh, the way we fund our capital plan. Looking at some investments in our other funds, you'll hear from both uh, Public Works and the airport about uh, some specific investments. But again, harking back to uh, the slide you saw earlier, Public Works has 14 positions recommended as part of this budget and airport 12, both within enterprise funds and not taxpayer supported. And then when we look at the capital fund, uh, which is where we account for capital infrastructure needs associated with general governmental functions, things like police, fire, parks, and libraries, uh, we have built into our forecast an increased transfer from the general fund uh, to address rising needs and inflationary impacts. Uh, that increase would look like an additional $500,000 beginning in fiscal year 25 and a million thereafter. We have seen uh, very high levels of escalation. And even with the uh, aforementioned increase in the base, the base transfer, we would not be able to keep up with the rising cost of all of our projects if we were to you know, just look to general fund resources um, to keep up with, with all of that. So uh, what we're proposing uh, partly in this year and then in, in our future years as well is a design to budget approach. So uh, we may need to look at scopes of certain projects to uh, comport with the allocated uh, funding amount. Uh, when we were talking earlier about fiscal responsibility, I mentioned how the capital fund is balanced. Uh, it is balanced to zero over the five-year forecast. Um, so effectively, uh, every dollar that's been allocated or is projected to be allocated to the capital fund is uh, projected to go to uh, certain projects. Uh, the one element I will mention is that we have established or we're recommending the establishment of a facilities reserve for future investments that are um, known but not necessarily quantified in things like library uh, library facilities such as you know an expansion at Hillcrest or other new library branches, uh, police facility needs to accommodate growth, uh, pools and our support facilities. That uh, facilities reserve is approximately $5 million. Um, and going forward, increases to projects or new projects that are outside of what has been uh, contemplated in the development of this budget uh, would require a trade-offs, uh, potentially even looking at that facilities reserve. Looking uh, at property tax, I'll, I'll have a few slides on this. Uh, again, the budget package includes a recommendation for 2% base growth. Uh, that 2% base growth was uh, developed in, uh, in the goal of achieving a balance between uh, preserving service levels uh, for currently authorized uh, services and keeping up with growth while also seeking to provide uh, relief to homeowners. Uh, by taking 2% rather than the 3%, uh, the base property tax budget is approximately $1.8 million lower than it otherwise would have been. 
Uh, cumulatively, that would be 7.5 million uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. That 1.8 million is recommended to be placed into the foregone balance. There will be additional relief uh, provided by statewide legislation. Um, that relief is possible in part due to online sales tax that otherwise uh, would have been flowing to cities, but is now being directed towards that property uh, tax relief. Also, the uh, mentioned uh, previously the continuation of the property tax uh, rebate program. Again, that was a very successful program with uh, just under 90% of um, eligible participate, uh, participants uh, engaging within that program. So pivoting towards the uh, average homeowner impact, um, I'll, I'll walk through this and then I'll, I'll walk through some, some takeaways from this and then be happy to answer any questions. Um, the, the first portion of, of this uh, chart up top shows what would happen if the city were to take the 3% the increase. So the first thing on line two, you can see that the assessed value for the average home uh, in fiscal year uh, 23, uh, that should say tax year 23, uh, fiscal year 24, is $486,000. So 13.8% lower than the prior year. With the homeowner's exemption, you can see on line four that the taxable value for that average home uh, is you know, just, uh, just under 18% lower than it was in the prior year. You can see the levy rate uh, on line five goes up. The levy rate has an inverse relationship to property tax value or to assessed values. So when assessed values go up, the levy rate goes down. When assessed values go down, the levy rate goes up. You can see the levy rate uh, increasing by 12%. But on line six, you can see that on that average priced home, the uh, if the city were to have taken a 3% increase, uh, the taxes on the city portion of that home would go down by just under 8%, uh, realizing savings of $123. On lines 8 through 14, it's the same analysis, but looking at if the city were to take 0%, so we like to provide bookends, and then at the bottom, we'll show what would the 2% be. And at the, the 2%, or excuse me, the 0% um, increase, the year over year change would be uh, $166 in savings um, or a 10.4% decrease. Lines 16 through 24 demonstrate the impact of taking 2%. And on line 22, you can see that the year over year change on the average homeowner uh, for their city portion of their property tax bill would be a savings of $137. The savings from taking 2% versus the, the max 3%, which would be allowed is approximately $14. And the cost of the 2% increase on the average homeowner, homeowner would be $28.55. There are uh, really favorable conditions for property taxes on the average homeowner this upcoming year. Um, first is really the, the decreases in assessed value for residential properties as compared to um, increasing values for commercial properties. This is the first time we've seen that in uh, several years whereby residential assessed values are going down and commercial are going up. Again, uh, for the third time in the last four years, the city is not taking the full allowable increase. And then there is a relief attributable to House Bill 292, uh, albeit unquantified at this point in time. So even before considering House Bill 292, uh, property taxes on the average home are expected to decline. Um, there is a, a lot more analysis that's required on uh, House Bill 292. Uh, there are a lot of data points that we don't necessarily have have access to or even not final at this point in time. Um, but based on the testimony of legislators as part of the 
2023 legislative uh, session. Uh, there was an estimate that there could be an additional 20% uh, savings, perhaps as much as $290 on top of that $138. Um, Eric, when do you expect us to know what that will be? Is that not until we actually get our property tax bills or will it be sooner? Uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor, uh, that would be probably closer to the time that we get the property tax um, bills in November. There are many calculations that go into that. Uh, statewide sales taxes, the, um, the state needs to calculate the eligible school bonds and levies. They need to look at the average daily attendance. There's a lot of things that go into that, but okay. we would know that closer to November. Great, thanks. So just a, just a takeaway um, on, on this slide, even before uh, considering the impacts of House Bill 292, uh, taxes uh, would go down uh, by nearly $124, even if the city were to take the max uh, property tax growth. That is not the recommendation included in, in this budget. The recommendation is 2%, so less than the max. So taxes on the average home would go down even more than that $124 and are expected to go down by nearly $138. With that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions, uh, comments before we go into the department uh, overviews. And Mary. So Eric, it looks like there's the, by taking the 2% versus the 3%, there's an average of $14.27 of extra savings. And if you added all of that up, that would get to that $1.8 million that you were talking about earlier. Um, the, okay, perfect. That is correct. Thank you, council member. Madam Mayor, I have a question. Um, Eric, I have some clarification on the facilities reserve. Do I understand this correctly that we're going to take 5 million out of the current capital budget and then after that it would basically be zero because uh, council, it'll be drained. Councilmember Willett said that is correct. Okay, thank you. Eric, can you go into that a little further because I just say I want to put a finer point on that. It's drained with the drained in the sense that we forward projected capital improvement needs over the years and so every dollar is a, is accounted for tied to a capital improvement need. Yes, Madam Mayor, that is correct. So when we develop our capital budget, uh, we do our very best shot to look at what the costs of, of all the vehicles we need to replace, all the major repairs, as well as all the discrete capital projects. Uh, things like you know fire stations, we have two underway right now, uh, IT needs, uh, various parks and recreation needs. So when we look at the cost of all of those projects um, and we compare that to the amount of revenues that we, uh, we foresee being transferred into the capital fund from the general fund, as well as things like interest earnings and impact fees and other sources, uh, we would be balanced to zero. We would be positively ba balanced or have a positive balance of $5 million, if not for that facilities reserve. Yeah. Yeah. So just for the public, I want to be clear that it's not that we're drawing it to zero today. It is balanced to zero with the needs and then the additional $5 million that we're holding for those things that we've said we will build um, when inflation and other things get back under control. That is correct. Thanks okay. for the clarification. Madam Mayor. Yes. Can you um, just clarify for me whether we've had a presentation from VRT with a request to increase by 0.5%? Does that include it in this budget or is it at the 5%? Uh, uh, Council Member, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, the included in this package is the 5% of property taxes as well as bridge funding of $1.5 million. And by bridge funding, we mean we're using one-time dollars to meet the need with some discussion with VRT around expectations and what that um, extra bridge funding would do. Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Eric. I really appreciate it. And it was nice to see that slide that has a little bit more granularity around um, homeowner impact. Can you go into a little bit the um, assessor's approach to um, valuation of properties and how that impacted this projection. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, uh, there are certain uh, criteria that all assessors statewide must uh, abide by. 
um, I might suggest that we come back with, uh, or even bring, ask the assessor to come back to go into greater detail uh, on the assessor's approach. That's probably something that I, I shouldn't speculate on too much. That would be great. And I remember having that presentation from the former assessor. It would be nice to have that again with our new assessor and kind of um, see what her approach is and ask some questions of her. So if we can get that set up in the future, I would appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric. Steve, you're on deck. Welcome. Good morning, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Steve Burgos. I'm the Public Works Director for the City, and uh, I am honored to be batting lead off here for the uh, department highlights. So for myself and the other directors, what we'll be presenting is a quick look back on FY23 and what we were able to accomplish with the investments that we made. And then we'll look forward to FY24 and share with you some of our perspectives on, on the, the asks that we have for budget and some of the big projects we'd like to get done in FY24. Let me go ahead and move forward. But before we do that, I thought it might be helpful just to give a quick overview of kind of what we do in public works. Uh, we have some new council members and for the public that might be listening in. We have uh, primary funding sources within public works are the general fund. Um, and we use that funding that Eric just alluded to for our climate action work. That includes our carbon emissions reduction, our energy planning, the water supply planning as well. We also in public works are responsible for city facilities. So all of the new buildings that get planned, designed and constructed, for example, fire stations, uh, new libraries, et cetera, that responsibility uh, lies within public works. And then we also operate and maintain the buildings. Uh, so all of the, everything from HVAC equipment to uh, light bulb replacements, to room setup, that's all part of public works. And we also own and operate the 10,000 streetlights uh, within the city's uh, inventory. And then we're also in, in charge of stormwater compliance related to the Clean Water Act. And of course we have our enterprise funds. We have four enterprise funds and those funds are probably best described as a fee for service. So for example, on the solid waste fund, um, rate payers pay their monthly bill, we get that revenue in, that revenue that comes in can only be used to provide services for solid waste. So it's the same thing for water renewal, geothermal and irrigation. And just a quick comment on water renewal. Um, in the past, uh, we had referred to water renewal as kind of our sewer fund or our wastewater fund. Those are not words that we like to use to describe our work. It's not very indicative of what we do. So several years ago, we uh, underwent a process for how do we better describe to the citizens the services that we're actually providing uh, with these water renewal facilities. And so we came up with um, the name for the utility to be water renewal services. And that's very, um, to us, very important because there is not a whole lot of waste that comes to us. We are recycling the biosolids for the farm that we land apply for local crop production. Uh, we're one of the first cities to have what we've referred to as struvite, which is taking the phosphorus back out of the water and creating fertilizer. And of course, there's the water itself that we renew and put back in the Boise River. So just to note, the water renewal services is kind of how we refer to these services in part because there's not a whole lot of waste in these facilities. Okay, moving on to the general trends for public works. I just wanted to highlight uh, four things in particular. One, uh, climate action leadership is happening throughout the city organization. Yes, in public works, we're in charge of leading the efforts around climate action, but a credit to the directors in the room and the staff at the city, this is getting down into the organization and we're making decisions that are helping drive our carbon emissions down, uh, helping save money. Um, you can see on the right there, the, the graphic from 2020 to 2021, our city government emissions is down 18%. While yes, we're in charge in public works, it's a credit to the rest of the city staff, the engagement on integrating all electric vehicles, on electrification of buildings, et cetera, that's helping drive that number. We continue to see very high participation rates in our curbit programs. Boiseans, Boiseans uh, love their solid waste programs. Um, and we have participation rates that, that make other cities very envious. For example, on the compost program, we have about a 96% participation rate for our citizens. Um, and I'll talk more about the impacts on the, on the solid waste fund later. Our utility account growth is between 1.5 to 2% over the past five years. 
that's almost a doubling of our utility accounts. We usually see about a 0.75 increase in years past. That's indicative of the growth of the city, right? And so as I show you some of the projects that we're proposing and some of the FTEs that we're requesting, those are related back to that growth that we're seeing. And then finally, um, on maybe a bit of a challenging side, we do continue to see the construction costs um, going in an upward trend, as, as Eric alluded to, and we're gonna continue to see that in the near term, things like material cost, labor costs are still significantly higher and increasing. Uh, we're not just saying, what was us? We're proactively planning around how do we best adjust things like the water renewal capital improvement program to better account for those increased costs and maybe um, move some projects out to reduce potential rate impacts on ratepayers. So those are just some big picture trends that we're looking at. And then I'll move on to the general fund within public works. I mentioned that's where we do our climate work, where we do our stormwater work in the buildings. Um, in 23, we made significant investment in several areas. One is we're still negotiating with Idaho Power and the PUC on the Clean Energy Your Way program. That's the what we refer to as our green tariff. We're really hoping that that's going to move forward in the next couple of months. That, that's been a long process. Um, but we hope to use that contracting, contracting mechanism to be able to offset the electricity that's used at, say, the airport and the two water renewal facilities. That's actually probably about half of our electricity that we use. Uh, we're hopeful to have that contract in place so that we can offset all of that electricity used to be 100% clean. We continue to electrify buildings um, and the city fleet. And then even it, just as good as the, the reduction in we've had, that we've had in our city government greenhouse gas emissions, in that same time frame, we've seen the community's greenhouse gas emissions go down. And that's even with growth happening in Boise. That reduction for the community from 2020 to 2021 was about 3%. That's a really cool story. And I think it's um, indicative of the priority that Boiseans place on climate action. Moving forward for FY24, we want to keep that momentum going on climate action. We've got some strong momentum going. Uh, we're going to continue with our electrification projects. We're going to uh, convert City Hall West, the Boise Depot, and the visiting Vista housing units just south of the airport on Vista. Uh, are actually north of the airport on Vista. Uh, we're gonna convert those to all electric. We have a fleet electrification policy that we've developed and we're gonna start to implement that for city um, vehicles. And then we're finalizing some water supply options. We're working with a consultant team. We hope to have that back to you within the probably next six months or so to frame up investments that we wanna make on water supply. We might recommend water rights purchases to city council to really think forward on this, the drought planning and making sure things like minimum stream flows in the Boise River can be protected. And then last but not least, we do have those the aging streetlights. We're gonna keep on top of that and replace some of those aging streetlights. Thank you to the council. Several years ago, you gave us the green light to go ahead and convert the LED uh, streetlights to LED. We're now 100% of our city owned streetlights are, are LED. Moving on to the Water Renewal Services Fund. Um, in 23, we, have, we, have, we are having an exciting year. Uh, we have installed our advanced water treatment pilot. It is up and running on the Micron parking lot, and I'm really looking forward to having you all come out and take a tour of that facility. That's some of the most advanced wastewater treatment technology that's available that we're testing out there for things like uh, some of those emerging constituents and our ability to remove things like PFOS, PFOA. Um, we replaced over five miles of pipeline this year. We have about a thousand miles in the system. And so we need to stay on top of that, that those old aging pipes, uh, we need to stay on top of that replacement so we don't have any failures. Excited to announce that we're wrapping up Lander Street phase one. Um, I've mentioned before that we're under budget on that project. It was a $62 million project and we're just a little bit under budget. Unfortunately, we're a little behind schedule because of a coatings issue that we had that we've, we've addressed with the subcontractor and we should be wrapping that up by the end of the year. And then uh, Eric alluded to the, some of the va vacancy challenges that we're having across the city, but, but some good news, I think. Um, we've had in public works, I think we peaked out at about a 17% vacancy rate. Last year, um, Mayor and Council approved investments in the HR department, and those investments are paying off for us. Um, it's in combination with good work by public works staff, innovative ways of thinking about how we recruit. Um, our vacancy rate, rate is down to about 10%, still high, but we're making progress and we're hoping to get that down to a more normal five to 7% here in the coming months. Moving on to 24, our outlook is we're gonna continue making those investments on behalf of our community. 
Uh, they gave us the green light through the wastewater bond, um, saw the needs that we had and said, we expect these things from you. I won't read those to you, uh, but we're continuing to invest in those. And the next slide, I'll show you how we're going to do that specifically with projects. We are asking for a residential rate increase, and this is very much in line with what we committed to as part of the wastewater bond education process. Um, but for the second year in a row, we're happy to, to share with council that instead of the 9.9% we had in the water wastewater bond education material, we're gonna be able to reduce that for residential rate pairs down to 7.5%. Realistically on a monthly basis, what does that mean? That's about a $3.25 increase on a monthly basis for our wastewater bills. The, that is not insignificant. That's not lost on us. Um, so we do have uh, affordability programs that we're implementing to make sure that those folks that are in the low income buckets um, have some help to pay those bills. I think first and foremost, the water renewal bond was ostensibly a, an affordability program. We were trying to reduce those upfront rate increases. But we also have other affordability programs that we offer to low income users. Um, the ERAP program, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program has been a huge help as related to the COVID funding. And it's our understanding there's another round of funding going to ERAP um, that can also be used for utility bills. In addition, we have the hardship discount program where you can get a 30% discount on utility bills for up to a year. We also have an emergency water utility bill assistance program where you can get $100 off of your utility bills. And then last but not least, we have the low income housing water assistance program that also helps with low income users. So again, not, not lost on us. Those rate increases are not insignificant, but we are implementing those affordability programs for low income users. So looking forward to 24, you see the list of investments there. I won't go into each one of those, but before I jump into the investments themselves, I just wanna highlight some good news. Uh, we have been making investments at the water renewal facilities around the very specific water quality improvements. So for example, uh, total phosphorus within the Boise River based on the improvements at our facilities has gone down significantly. The result is we're seeing improvements in the river in ways that we haven't necessarily seen in years past. When we passed it, or when we, when you all passed the utility plan in FY20, um, we shared with you that one of the uh, primary pieces of feedback we got from the community is that they expect us to protect the river. It's one of our most treasured pieces of green infrastructure. So those investments are paying off. What you see there in the upper picture is a beautiful brown trout that our staff caught during a fish survey. And on the bottom right, we actually have freshwater mussels coming back to the river. That's a good thing. This is not an invasive species. Um, that is a very good thing. It's a good indication of water quality. And they're actually tagging that mussel that you see there in the picture to track kind of how long they're in the, in the river. Um, they started appearing recently within the last couple of years. It was not something that we saw um, just 10 years ago. So that's a really good sign of high water quality and the improvements um, being made within the river. Specific for 24, you can see the list of projects. I won't read those all to you. We're, we've got phase two starting out at Lander Street, wrapping up phase one, moving on to replacing a lot more of the, the aging infrastructure there. Several projects at West Boise. We're continuing with the recycled water program you see there. The large and small diameter sewer rehab, we've been investing between four and six million on an annual basis. We need to pick up that investment. That system is aging out. Um, some sections are about 100 years old. And we just want to stay proactively ahead of that replacement so we don't have any catastrophic failures. I'll highlight the Enhance the River investments. That's a, an exciting one for us. We're one of the first cities in the U.S. that worked with the, the, the regulatory agency for the Clean Water, well, Clean Water Act, in our case, the DEQ, um, to, in lieu of mechanical solutions at the facilities, like chillers and cooling towers, to address temperature issues on the river. We're, instead of that, we're going to pursue in-stream restoration projects reintroduce side channels. Um, and it's our way to mitigate the temperature impacts that's related to climate change, but in a way that's a very natural um, approach for the river as opposed to some engineered solution at the facilities. So we're excited to be kicking that off in 24. Um, and then you can see two other projects, util utility billing software, we're splitting that cost with the solid waste fund and then a percent for art. We're excited about that part because we did spend a fair amount of time with the arts and history department uh, developing our master plan for arts. And we're really excited to get that rolling in 24 and start investing that, that percent for our program. Moving on to our solid waste program, uh, FY23, we invested um, money to bring in four additional uh, all electric trucks. 
Uh, we've got the compost facility that we expanded. You can see a picture of the expanded facility there that goes back to the, the residents really dig their, their compost program. And just, you know, we drive these programs, we set goals, and sometimes we do exceed them. And so in this case, uh, we had set a goal for the compost program back in 2017 to have a diversion rate of all of our material around the 35 to 40% diversion rate from the landfill. We're actually exceeding that. When I say we, it's not me, it's not staff, it is the citizens of Boise that are engaged in these programs. And so we offer these programs, um, they take advantage of it to the tune of 42% diversion rate from the landfill. Just to give you a sense of perspective, the national average is about 32%. So we're well above the national average. And you said earlier, or somebody said, the percentage use rate. So how many, how, what percentage of our residents use the composting program? About 96%. 96, participate. okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. FY24, look, moving forward, um, while 42% is great, we want to keep developing other programs. And one of the things we want to focus on, and we'll be in front of uh, Mayor and Council asking for your feedback on some of our policy considerations, is how do we get further up the supply chain? We are getting a lot of material, right? We're getting a lot of material to handle. That's ex expensive, frankly. It's costly to handle that material. We're wondering how do we reduce the amount of material coming out of homes? So how do we get further up the supply chain? Um, so focusing on reduce and reuse. So that's something that we're bringing back to you. Stay tuned for that. We're excited about the, the possibilities there and we'll be bringing that back for policy discussion. There's the utility building software, the other half that I mentioned. And then we are promote, proposing a 4.9% rate increase to cover increasing costs within, within solid waste. We still see volatility, price volatility on commodity prices for recycling. They're still down and, and seem to be going up and down, it seems, on a monthly basis. And then we also have increased labor costs for public services. So we are proposing a 4.9% rate increase for your consideration. The, that equates to about a uh, dollar and ten cent increase per month for the average residential customer, and that's about a little over thirteen dollars uh, over the year. And then finally, on our geothermal and irrigation programs, um, this past year we are working on several improvements. You've probably driven past Eleventh Street. That was a kind of an opportunistic, um, op an opportunistic project to. Uh, improve some of the geothermal system along 11th Street. We're also going to be completing a 10th Street project. Um, we have four new geothermal connections this year. Um, we're really excited about those. I'll talk about that in a second. And then we were able to acquire um, the U-Stick Lateral. So there was a, a gentleman that used to run the U-Stick Lateral. He was retiring. And so we went to those um, members of that Lateral Association and asked if they wanted the city to take that over. They said yes. And so we're expanding the irrigation system. That's a good thing. That's um, using surface water for irrigation of lawns instead of drinking water. That's a, that's a good thing. So we're happy to take that on. And then for FY24, excited about it. continued expansion of geothermal. We have four new connections coming on in 24. So between 23 and 24, those eight new connections, that's about a 10% growth in square footage downtown of heated buildings. Um, that's a little bit abstract. If you were to convert, convert that to carbon reduction between 23 and 24, that's the equivalent of taking about 4.45 million car miles off the road. So a significant contribution to our carbon emission reduction approach. And then last but not least for geothermal, we are proposing a 4.9 rate increase for geothermal. That system is aging. Um, to put that in perspective, we have not had a, a rate increase for geothermal since 2010. And we actually had a rate decrease in 2013 when natural gas prices took a nosedive. We do have an aging system. Most of it was installed in the early 80s, and we just need to start building up some fund balance to replace um, that aging infrastructure. So we are proposing a 4.9% rate, inc rate increase for FY24. And with that, I will stand for questions before I kick it over to Rebecca. Madam Mayor. Yeah. Um, Steve, thank you so much for the presentation. I think that you know by now that I admire the work that Public Works does and how it connects to basically everything we do in the city. Um, I have a question around life cycle, especially when we're looking at carbon reductions and emission reductions. How does that play into the calculations that your team uses when um, you say something like an 18% reduction in city emissions? How does that take life cycle into account? Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Woodings, thank you for the question. So we do things like, oops, I'm accidentally hitting the mouse. Uh, 
we uh, consider things like the social cost of carbon and community cost of carbon and decision making. So, for example, if we do an analysis of, um, you know, there's different options of um, water renewal improvement. And we look at the energy or electricity that's needed for that improvement and the different options that we have. Yeah, there's a capital component and there's certainly an O&M component, but we include a risk cost associated with those different options where we capture the community cost of carbon. Do we necessarily fund that? No, but we're trying to use that as a variable to better, to make smarter decisions on our investments and capturing that, that community cost of carbon. So those are the kind of evaluations we do. We do the same thing on electrification of buildings. We look at the community cost of carbon to consider like, okay, that's a delta that we could reduce. Um, and so therefore it makes sense to fund it. Because at some point we will see a carbon tax or some kind of cap and trade program. I think that's a pretty real thing to be thinking about. And so we're trying to think, get ahead of that, account for that costing. And so that can help drive decisions to reduce carbon. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, Madam Mayor, um, Steve, great to see you. You had a slide about some of our uh, diversion impacts and percentages. And I think that we do some work, there we go. I think we do some work with Republic Services and kind of partnering with them um, that have helped us with some of those electric trash trucks and some other things. I was wondering if you could kind of speak to where they fit into um, that part of the budget. Madam Mayor, uh, Councilmember Hallenburn, thanks for the question. So Republic Services, they're our franchise hauler. So they have a contract within the city to do all of the hauling for our trash, recycling, compost, et cetera. They've been a really good partner over the years um, where they have some innovative ideas that they wanna test out. Frankly, they typically come to Boise first because we're open to those discussions and willing to try things like we were the, fir the first city in the Republic um, service territory across the nation to have the uh, compressed natural gas trucks. Well, when they were going to roll out the all electrics, they came to us first in Boise to say, hey, we're, we want to try this. Are you guys up for it? And so the partnership we have with them is a, a really strong one. Um, they know that we like to innovate. Um, they know that we, we're pragmatic about it, but we do like to innovate. And so they'll come to us with ideas on, on different concepts that they might want to test. And then from here in Boise, they'll roll that out to the rest of the fleet that they have across the country. Yeah, I had a chance to talk with them a little bit at the, the leadership summit and they love working with you um, and your team. So they wanted to relay some compliments there. And I would assume that the more that we can divert stuff from the landfill, the better it is for them as well. So it seems like a, a great partnership. Um, I did have one other question. I think it was on Eric's slide. We had something about maybe it was 12 or 14 employees related to the enterprise fund. And first of all, um, I'm always an advocate for uh, staff to get the job done and you have to make sure that you've got a good balance there. I was wondering um, if you know kind of where those positions are going, what type of positions those are. Madam Mayor, Council Member, absolutely. Um, and we don't take that request lightly. We know that's, that's um, uh, an ask of the council. Um, as we move forward, we're, we're trying to address things like uh, we, we use consultants for different projects that we have. In one case, we're using a consultant to do program management out at Lander Street, for example. Uh, as part of that contract, we're using a controller that's funded through that consultant. Well, we know that a controller for our program management approaches is going to be needed on city staff. So we feel like, okay, let's go ahead and bring them in to save money on the services that we're currently paying a consultant to do. That's one example. Another is we're asking for several supervisors. Um, we have folks within Public Works, their span of control for the number of staff that they're managing is just getting too big. So we have, for example, um, folks out at the facilities where they're managing 13, 14 people. And it's not fair to the, the employees who are reporting to that supervisor because they're so busy doing their work and then supervising. 13, 14 employees. So we're trying to bring on supervisors that help address that, that strain. Then we just have growth in our system. I mentioned the account growth. Um, we have uh, op two operator twos that we're bringing on. Uh, we have an industrial maintenance supervisor. Uh, so those are the kind of things that we're bringing on to address, address both growth, but also some of the, the costs that we're using our consultants. We want to bring in house and then the expansion of uh, or addressing some of the supervisors that are just overseeing too many folks. Yeah, absolutely. Th thanks for that clarification. And I really do appreciate that investment in staff. You know, if we do it right, we can keep all of them around for a lot longer, recruit a little bit better um, and do all those things. So I think it's a good investment. Thank you. Oh, we did. Okay, great. Anything else? Great. Thank you. Thank and you, now Mary. we've got the airport up.
Good morning, Madam Mayor, members of council. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, very excited to be here and share with you some of the things that we're working on at the airport. So probably the most important thing at the airport that we do is enable the traveler and passenger experience. And our goal is even as the airport grows, we wanna make sure that we're maintaining the sense of Boise and the place that is Boise that we all love. We often hear from passengers how much they love traveling through the Boise airport because it's convenient. And we recognize that as we grow, it's important that we maintain that smaller community airport feel, but provide the larger community amenities. And so we're really looking at as we move forward, how do we grow in pace with the community, but still be authentic to who we are um, as Boise. So that's kind of how we framed our, our improvements and this budget. And I just wanted to point out that one of the key things when you're traveling, one of the most important things is that your flights are on time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the official airline guide listed Boise as the second most punctual airport in North America, which I would love to take credit for personally, but it really comes down to two things. One, a fantastic instrument landing system. So when we have inversions and fog, aircraft can land in low visibility. And then the other is the fact that we don't have substantial um, weather issues or uh, congestion delays. Madam Mayor. And people. <laughs> yes. And, and the your, people and who get out people, there and, right? pl and plow the runways quickly and get off. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for Madam that. Madam Mayor, I just want to note that my spirits are bolstered this morning by knowing that there is a punctuality league report. <laughs> I think it feels like that's a league that I probably need to be a member of because I'm not punctual um, and maybe I have some things to learn, but I think that's fantastic. Thank you. It's really important to our airline partners as well, because they need to have that predictability that they can come in and get out. So uh, that is important. And I think we all sense this when we travel, but it was really nice to see this quote from uh, Kurt Siegler who's with NPR national desk correspondent about how the Boise airport is a travel hack because it's convenient um, and flexible. And that's really what we want to maintain. And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the airport and our passenger service and passenger experience. But I do want to note that the airport is much more than a passenger uh, terminal. It is, uh, we are home to over 200 tenants at the airport. And we have several federal agencies at the airport, including the National Interagency of Fire Centers, which is incredibly important. We also have both the, the Idaho Air and Army National Guard. We have customs on our field. ITD, uh, Idaho Transportation Department has a hangar at the airport. So we are much more than just an air service provider. And this past year, one of the things that with council's help and allocation of additional staff, we were able to prioritize actually taking some of our land that we had purchased as a noise buffer to productive use for industrial and manufacturing. And so we did break ground earlier this year on a, this particular project and picture is from uh, Black Market Gelato. And we expect to see more similar types of construction moving forward. And this allows us to better utilize our existing resources and also helps us to diversify revenue and make sure that if we do have a downturn in passengers, that we have additional revenue streams coming in. But back to passengers, because that's what we're all thinking about when we think about the airport. And I think this was touched on earlier in the presentation, uh, probably by Eric about how Idaho and our community specifically has seen tremendous growth in the Treasure Valley. And obviously that translates into increased demand for services in Boise, but probably no place more than at the Boise airport, because we are the airport, not only for Boise, but for Meridian and Star and Eagle and Mountain Home and the entire region. And so we are expecting to see a substantial increase in passenger travel. So, so far this year, we're, we're seeing an increase in 17.7%. That's almost 20% increase in passenger travel through the end of March, which is the latest date data that we have. 
And we're also measuring that in our cost per end plane passenger. And we've talked about this before, but I'll reiterate it in the event that someone is listening that maybe is not familiar with this data point. But the cost per end plane passenger is a very common industry uh, key performance indicator, which takes your total costs for operating the airport and then divides it by the number of passengers. So you can see over the years, our cost per passenger has gone down primarily because our costs have remained relatively constant, but our passenger numbers have increased dramatically with the exception of course, 2020, when passenger numbers went way down. And we're looking at, and we're tracking our cost per end plane passenger, because this is important to our airline tenants and our airline partners. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're generating sufficient revenue from the airlines to continue to invest in our facility. And this cost per end plane passenger is still substantially lower than all of our peer airports. We anticipate our cost per end plane passenger for this year will be about $5. So for every airline ticket you buy, $5 of it comes to the airport in terms of fees and revenues. That's what they would pay to us. I do want to highlight some of the recent investments and impact that we've had. And if you've traveled, which I think most of you have, and it feels like most of the entire region has traveled through the Boise airport so far this year, you can see many of these improvements out there. Our public parking garage is probably the most visible and I think probably most desired by our (laughs) community uh, that has been under construction and will open later this summer. Both our employee parking garage and the rental car garage are enabling projects. So that way we will be able to build concourse A where employees and rental cars park today is where the future concourse A will be. Taxiway S or taxiway Sierra, as we call it, is a new taxiway that goes out towards the Sky West hangar and the new Amazon cargo facility. We also constructed a cargo aircraft parking apron And we have continued to invest in low emission uh, equipment so that way we can continue to improve our air quality. When you look at our revenue mix, uh, we have about 66, $67 million in revenue. It's pretty evenly divided. Parking is our largest revenue generator, followed shortly by airline fees and then car rentals the passenger facility charge, which is the fee that gets charged to your ticket that goes directly back into funding infrastructure. Um, The customer facility charge, very similar, that gets added to rental car contracts that goes back into constructing rental car facilities and then grants and terminal concessions. And I mentioned this earlier, but we are continuing to focus on diversifying our revenue. And these are all new revenue sources that we added in 2023, uh, including valet parking. That has been a huge success, not only from a revenue perspective, but from a customer service perspective. The non-aeronautical property development that I mentioned earlier, uh, fees from transportation network companies, those are the Ubers and Lyfts of the world. Again, increases in airline revenue because of the airline use and lease agreements that we renegotiated. And with the intent of retaining more of our revenue at the airport to invest in our infrastructure. And then with the addition of a new major tenant, Amazon, that also adds to the bottom line, generating almost $4 million in new revenue, not counting increases in revenue due to increased passenger activity. So the airport is performing very well financially. So I want to talk with you about what we're asking for in FY24. And some of these projects you've probably seen before, the rental car garage design and phase one construction, that's that bottom picture. We've talked about it before, but this project will be transformational for the Boise airport. I also should mention that with all of these capital projects that we're investing in in our airport, we will also be investing in that 1% for art. And so we're envisioning artwork on the front facade of this car rental garage. So as you come in the entryway, again, really creating the sense of place that is Boise um, and reflecting our community. So that particular project will really shape and frame 
the way people who are approaching the Boise airport, their impression of our community. Uh, taxiway Delta, we'll be relocating that. That's to comply with changes to the FAA design standard. The runway improvement mitigation design, again, that is FAA driven to make sure that our runway ends align because we have two parallel runways and they are currently offset. And then Concourse A, apron construction, that will be the first phase of the new concourse but actually constructing the aircraft parking apron so that way we have additional parking spaces. And then we'll start the process actually of planning for Concourse A. And with that, I will stand for questions. Madam Mayor. Yes. This is just the compliments part. Um, thank you for everything you do out at the airport. It has, you know, for a while, I think it was a little bit tough. We were a little short on space. And now with the uh, improvements to the security area, things have just really streamlined. Um, it's been a pleasure to travel in and out. My record now from the front door of my house all the way through security and to the Alaska gate is 17 minutes. Oh, impressive. But I don't yeah. recommend that the traveling public try that as a general rule. Well, no, then I get there plenty early to like grab a coffee and hang out and relax. And, you know, you always know someone down there. Um, so it really has made the travel experience so nice. And thank you to your team so much. Always arrive an hour and a half early <laughs> at the Boise airport for the record, because you just never know. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. All right, we've got one more before the break. Tim's up with Planning Development Services. Welcome. Mayor, members of council, Tim Keene, Director of Planning and Development Services for the city. Um, first, a little bit about planning. Unlike your first two presentations this morning, planning and development services does not control any city facility at all. And so our work is very much involved with working with the private sector people in Boise to further the goals of the city. So that means everyone from individual residents to neighborhoods to builders in seeking to shape the city as Boise is seeking to shape it. These are the functions of, of planning and development services that very much has to do with seeking to ensure that the ever-changing physical environment of the city can help us achieve our big goals and enable growth that furthers what makes this city distinctive. And these are all aspects of that. When it comes to uh, 2023, I'm gonna go through a few slides that speak to these um, priorities in, in fiscal year 23. All of these are not necessarily new to council members, but uh, for everyone to remind ourselves what we've been working on this year in the areas especially of permitting and kind of customer service the all the work that's been going on around our development rules and then the the importance of housing in the city as, as has been mentioned several times already this morning when it comes to permitting uh Clearly, we're in a, a period of transition right now where we sit today in, in, in May of 2023, but looking at, at so far this fiscal year, these, this chart here shows where we were in terms of permitting. So what we saw through throughout the calendar year of 2022, so into fiscal year 2023, was, was a reduction in the number of permits that we were issuing. So we went uh, slightly down uh, in the calendar year 2022 from 2021 to a total of between 21,000 and 22,000 permits. But in that calendar year, we also had an increase in the value of construction we permitted. So you see this in the city. We, while the number of permits was down, the, the, the scale of them was up. So our actual value of construction went up in 2023. We do see this year as a transition, as you know, we constantly speaking to people that are building in the city and we're certainly in a, a period of uncertainty around important issues like inflation and costs and financing and lots of things. So we certainly are in a period where there's much less certainty than there was over the past few years. 
which is a good time to look at how you do your work. And, and our zoning code is essential to that. We've been working on this in Boise really since 2019, but the first step in that process was to evaluate the zoning ordinance that we have today and determine what its specific shortcomings are given the dynamics in Boise that we have today. So the public process started in earnest in the fall of 2020. So we're two and a half years into a public process that will be coming to city council soon. Um, and again, given where we are with the uncertainty around development and construction um, in the city, it is a good time to actually be looking at, at changing our rules around development. <clears throat> When it comes to that zoning ordinance, it's been a wonderful experience to be able to spend so much time in the community and talk about these big goals we have going back to Blueprint Boise and trying to discuss in more specifics what the city's comprehensive plan is seeking to achieve for the city. And again, most of these, many of these, most of these, uh, these goals and achievements have to do with how people act privately in the city. Um, and how we create a variety of housing options um, in Boise, how we, uh, how we have a development pattern that is less water and energy consumptive, how we create options for how people get around the city. And that has very much to do with the development pattern that we create through our rules and how private people build the city. And then that we're protective of nature um, and Boise has such a unique opportunity when it comes to becoming more of a city, but also protecting natural places, intact landscape around us. So our zoning ordinance is, is our way to align those goals with the rules that we have for how private people build. Also in, 20, in fiscal year 23, the mayor and city council made the first really significant investment that the city's ever had in the history of the city around housing which has really started to bear fruit in Boise. These are projects that you know about, but it's an interesting collection of them because we now have complete the Martha um, in central Boise. And this is a total of 48 units. And it, it's a project that was the city's role. And it really was a policy role, a regulatory role in the sense that it is a project that took advantage of the city's new housing bonus ordinance. We've had a total of now including one that's working through the process now, we'll have a total of seven different uh, new home projects in Boise that have taken advantage of that housing bonus ordinance, which in the realm of building and construction, seven new projects taking advantage of a new ordinance over a period of 18 months or so is, is really good. The Franklin and State and Arthur are just two great examples of where the public needs to invest money in housing in order to address these big housing goals the city. The city has um, the Franklin at the corner of Franklin and Orchard on the bench will have a total of 205 units and 184 of those will be affordable for people making 60% or less of area median income. This development also sits at an important corner Lots of services nearby. It will actually include a child care center. It's as good an example as you can find anywhere of the kind of investment cities should be making. In this case, the city, of course, invested in the land and then in the, in the financing that helped this happen. When you think about people making 60% of area median income, we're talking about people making between 15 and $20 per hour. So this is a vast amount of the city. When you think about people in service jobs, working in the food and beverage industry or in retail or working at the city, so many jobs are in that realm. And the vast majority of units at the, at, uh, the Franklin will be of that type. State and Arthur is the same. It's 102 units, 87 of them will be affordable for people making 60% or less. And and this is where the public's role is so important to get to those income levels that we're all speaking about in this city. We're talking about people that are working that previously or too often have to drive distances to get to housing that they can afford. So here we are building it in the city and that would not happen without the city's investment in these two projects. In the case of State and Arthur, the city also has funding in that one. The city does not have funding in the Martha. That is a policy regulatory uh, investment that the city made to, to make that happen. Those income 
uh, thresholds at the Martha are higher. They're at 80 to 100 percent of area median income. That's the way it works. Through policy and regulation, we should get to 80 to 100 percent of AMI. When we want to get lower than that, the city needs to invest in it. The city's overall goal in terms of housing, which we're working on, this relates to this current fiscal year as well as the new fiscal year, is 250 new permanent supportive housing units, 1,250 new affordable housing units, again, for the types of individuals and families that were uh, helping at the Franklin and State and Arthur, and then 1,000 preserved units. Um, by the way, the Martha also has two supportive housing units within it. Um, then, uh, talk, shifting to 2024, I'll go through these in a little bit more detail as well with some other slides, but again, back to permitting, this is a job that's never done, um, uh, trying to, to seeking to improve the way you serve people, uh, in, in the permitting process, pending council's, uh, deliberations and whatever council's action is in June looking forward in 2024 towards uh, potentially having new rules that we're gonna have to implement, uh, continued investment in housing and also, also uh, our pathways program and especially implementation and construction. When it comes to our permitting process, one thing we did in 2023 and fiscal year 2023 was do a complete evaluation of all of our systems we had a private outside consultant come in and spend time with all of our staff to determine how we can do better when it comes to the service that's provided. They generated a report with a whole series of recommendations. So one thing that you'll see in our budget for PDS is a continued investment in those enhanced services. So we have a third party that helps us with plan review, which is very important to keep people moving, especially big projects in the city, whether it's an economic development project or new housing in the city, we've got to have, um, uh, we've got to have some support to do that quickly and well. So we'll have that in this budget for you. And, and, and then in addition, also getting some help to implement all the recommendations of this report, which is a wide variety of things that will take us time, but it's important to, and we've already started work on it, but we need some help to, to implement this. Um, the, uh, when it comes to the zoning code, uh, we do have some things in mind if council decides to vote in favor of this, pending that action by council, including, and I've talked about this to council uh, last summer, that we need to create a, a much more user-friendly version of the code once it's adopted so that people can take advantage of these incentives in particular around affordable housing. So it's almost like a graphic novel version of the zoning ordinance we'd like to produce if council in fact votes for this. Huge public education process around this, you know, that involves neighborhoods, also builders and developers. Uh, when we create a whole new set of rules, we're gonna have to spend a lot of time with people to get them comfortable with the rules themselves and also the new processes. And just the team and, and planning uh, in the planning group within PDS is, is busy preparing for implementation of the new code. So many great people there that are spending much of their time now thinking through how we in fact um, turn on a new code and how our processes are shifting to serve people well. When it comes to housing, except accelerating housing development and preservation, and then focusing this year, and you've, you've talked about this some already on the city's rental properties, which are such a great resource to the city and very affordable housing that we've got to protect and maintain. And then the implementation of the pathways program on the housing and development um, uh, recommendations uh, or the, what we're expecting in 2024 is a series of other new developments in the city based on the city's investment in housing. That includes the McKinney property, which is a great opportunity right off Fairview. And then Capitol Campus, which the city has been seeking to advance for many years and is now moving forward. Uh, the city, along with our partner, Boise State University has selected a great developer to implement here. So we'll see a lot more about that in 2024. I do wanna mention again, as it relates to housing, the investment that we need to make in our rental properties, which are such an important resource, the, the rents at our rental properties are, are as affordable as any in the city. 
and there's opportunities at our rental properties to do more. So it's such a great resource and really falls in that category of uh, preservation and new affordable housing in the city, the city's goals related to those things. And then the pathways program, and I spoke to council recently about this and the, the shift to really implementation on pathways and an investment in our ability to build and, and bring the community into the process of implementing the vision around pathways in Boise and the importance of that vision towards a growing city that more people can get around without driving, and more people have access to safe places to ride their bike and walk to the things they need. And that is it for planning and development services. I do want to mention that I've got the leaders from PDS here with me. They'll be the ones uh, doing all this work. Jessica Zelag, who leads the planning team, Maureen Brewer in housing, uh, Jason Blaze, who leads the buildings group that does all the permitting and inspections, and then Yvette Harris, who's our, our operations person within planning. Thank them for all their work and, and joining for joining us today. Any questions, Mayor? Mayor? Yes. More compliments um, Good. to your team. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that we've been so incredibly focused on housing over the past few years, and your team has really risen to the occasion, um, moving this zoning code through having such robust public involvement in that, um, and now headed into hearings, I feel really prepared. And I really appreciated your mention of the graphic novel version, because as someone who's about halfway through the um, zoning code ordinance right now, I think a graphic novel version would be just hugely helpful and um, probably way more illustrative of what we're going for, for people who are wanting to use it. So thanks, Tim, and yeah. thanks um, PDS team for all of your work. Madam Mayor, uh, Tim, just another note that I'm excited to see that we're getting into that implementation phase with the Pathways Plan, both with some funding that's dedicated, but also that dedicated staff member who maybe started on, on Monday. Started yesterday. Yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm very excited to see that um, moving along uh, and something that can, you know, complement a lot of the housing issues that we're working with, too. Yes, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Paging council members. Oh, wrong way, Colin, wrong way. <laughs> the, we're all have um, Jamie go ahead and step in so we don't end up inadvertently creeping into lunch. Welcome. We've got the legal department with us now. Okay, now I'm on. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of council, uh, my name is Jamie Sullivan. I'm the Boise City Attorney, and I'm here to provide an update on the legal department and the investments and the impact uh, that your investments have had on the legal department as we serve the community. You know, you often don't see legal in council chambers on this side of the, the dais, but that doesn't mean we're not active in the courtroom and in our community. And as you know, legal consists of three central divisions. First, we have the municipal division. It serves the city throughout all of the municipal departments, internal and external facing alike, DFA, HR, the airport, and public works. It also provides support for mayoral and council initiatives, as well as city boards and commissions, and intergovernmental support, even when the legislative season comes to an end. Next, we have the public safety division, supporting Boise's fire and police departments in their endeavors to keep our community safe, as well as provide litigation support and advice. And finally, there's the largest division, the criminal division. We prosecute misdemeanor and infraction cases for the city of Meridian and the city of Boise, as well as conflict felony cases throughout with the Treasure Valley. I wanted to talk first a bit about the investments for fiscal year 23 and how they have supported the city's accomplishments. With respect to the municipal division, we assisted you all with 54 ordinances, drafted 753 resolutions, and reviewed over 700 contracts through purchasing alone. 
We supported over 137 public meetings, including 43 city council meetings, 17 meetings for planning and zoning commission, 12 design reviews, 11 historic, or excuse me, 12 historic preservation committees, 11 housing authority meetings, 10 library board, nine public works, eight for parks and rec, four arts and history, seven districting committee meetings, and four ethics commission meetings. And finally, as the external departments you've heard today celebrate their accomplishments, um, as Parks will talk about strides to make the 10 minute walk to parks, innovative housing, affordable housing projects, and airports expansion of physical grounds and services, legal shares in those accomplishments by providing solid legal guidance and strate strategic support throughout the city. And the Public Safety Division Legal facilitated two successful collective labor agreements with police and fire, ensuring that our communities are kept safe and secure and continue to enjoy the high level of service our public safety departments provide. We also supported our vulnerable populations by ensuring the community receives funds dedicated to addressing the harm caused by substance abuse through the opioid settlements. And finally, the criminal division ensured that our community received justice by prosecuting just shy of 11,500 misdemeanors, just over 5,000 infractions, and appeared in court for over 20,720 appearances. That division averages two to three jury trials a week. We also gave back to the legal community by collaborating with the University of Idaho College of Law and hosting three criminal internships, giving them the boots on the ground experience and training that will serve them as they in the future serve our community. And so from a department perspective, I also wanted to update you on the legal's case management investment. Legal has been working diligently with IT. There you are. Uh, with IT and our outside vendor to migrate existing data and prepare for implementation. We anticipate going live September this year. And that takes us to fiscal year 24 and the next steps to realize legal strategic goals for and a continuation of investments in people and process and assets to better serve the city. With respect to people, I'm requesting to expand the public safety division to address current litigation needs as well as build capacity for the future. As our community grows, so does the complexity and the number of legal matters that confront the city. This growth is reflected in the increase of in-house responsibilities as well. This includes providing risk and safety advice, managing class actions and outside contracts, as well as subrogation and collection matters. We simply need to grow the division to keep up with the needs of the city. With respect to process, we're requesting a continued investment in the citywide investigation fund. Last year, we piloted a centralized fund to provide investigatory services through or to the city in a variety of contexts. And I'm happy to report that it was a successful pilot. We were able to utilize this fund to ensure regulatory compliance, obtain preliminary data, address conflicts, tackle backlog, and minimize liability while ensuring consistency, quality, and efficiency in fact-finding. This fund has been used in the areas of ADA compliance, HR investigations, internal affairs, and civil litigation. Based on the results of this pilot, we are asking it to be a standard line item to ensure its availability and expand its application as the needs of the city grow. And finally, legal is asking for an investment in assets. You know, access to public information is a vital tenant of good governance. And last year alone, legal processed just shy of 15,500 public records requests through the BPD and municipal portal. This is a new record and just shy of 5,000 more than the previous year. A new public records platform will benefit the community and staff alike by ensuring consistency, efficiency, and regulatory compliance. 
This investment will further the city's commitment to support the public's right to be informed of the city's business and enhance the city's, or the, excuse me, enhance the user experience with faster response times, greater transparency, and ease of use. Staff will also benefit from this investment citywide with increased efficiency from technology and reduced staff time. And again, thank you for your time and attention here today. We appreciate your continued support, support that enables us to support the city moving forward. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Yep. I just did the quick math and that's uh, 60 public records requests a day. Can you tell me a little bit more about how this technology may save us a lot of time and money? Because that's, a, I mean, look, the public interest in documents is important. It's, it, and it doesn't even matter if it's important because it's the law, we have to do it. But I am aware from your presentation last year how incredibly expensive it is. And uh, it's been in my mind, particularly as we've heard about public records issues, um, reporting to the press on it, et cetera, in the last year, it's been a topic of conversation. And so I just briefly like to learn a little bit more about um, what you're looking at to try to streamline this process from our end. Absolutely, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Bajan. We're looking for twofold. One, um, with efficiency internally by being able to tag more documents uh, easily and also looking for a more uh, user-friendly outward-facing uh, module so that uh, the public has access to the information that's already been uh, released as well. Well, for your sake, Godspeed. <laughs> Madam Mayor, yeah. um, thank you so much, Jamie. And um, I appreciate some of the kind of process improvements and how those are gonna help our citizens um, have a better experience with the city. I had a question about the public safety expansion. We recently learned that property and violent crimes are down in the city. So I'm wondering what's driving the need for that expansion. You may not even wanna answer this right now. It may be for follow-up, but. And uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member uh, Woodings, the we haven't had a new attorney uh, in the litigation division, uh, from my understanding, way before I have been here. So just keeping up with the 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 general caseload um, collections. Uh, the tort claims, uh, I can give you some stats of how we've seen all of those numbers uh, increase as well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Next up, we've got IT with Alex Winkler. No, wait a second. Oh, there's Alex. I saw Carrie getting up and I thought I had <laughs> said the wrong department. There's Alex right behind Jamie. Great, thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Mayor, City Council. My name is Alexander Winkler and I am the Chief Information Officer for the City of Boise. I'm excited to stand before you today and talk about um, the exciting work that's been happening in the technology department. Um, you'll hear woven through many of my colleagues presentations, aspects of technology, and that's what we do here, is we support the strategic direction of all these different departments by partnering with them on how might we use technology to support all of what we do at the city. So it's not only new projects and new um, innovations at the city, but it's also maintaining that which we already have and what we use to run our business. So as an IT department, we maintain thousands of desktops and laptops, the very things you're using today to do your business, terabytes of data. We maintain hundreds of applications that we both license and develop and maintain ourselves, okay? And then all of those applications and the work we do every day creates that data and that all sits on servers that we manage and runs through our fiber that we network throughout our city facilities. We maintain the um, and light up the infrastructure for 90 plus city facilities. So that's all done by this um, IT department of which I am quite proud. That kind of is a summary of our functions. Over the past year, um, we've been able to make good on the investments that the city council has put in IT over the last several years. My predecessor, Erica Cobb, focused primarily in her time here 
on updating and modernizing the staffing framework of IT. How do we take these kind of custom IT roles that we developed over time and make them industry standard? This allows IT to hire, to upskill, to keep up with technology that we see on the outside. And we've been able to make good on that and only have two vacancies in IT right now, which is an incredible progress that we've been able to make over the last couple of years. So thank you for your investment in our people and technology. Now what? We just developed a three-year strategic plan that now gets to focus on our operational effectiveness. How, using these new roles and teams, can we better serve our partners across all the departments and our constituency. So you'll see a big focus on operational efficiency. That was even mentioned um, this morning by the chief of staff that we will be um, focusing in on over the next three years. Another thing, historically, we've managed our IT along departmental lines. This is the that portfolio and that portfolio and that portfolio kind of along purely the verticals. We recognize the need now with the complexity of these systems growing and the need to integrate and move data around our technology and data portfolio, we recognize the need to do that in a different way. So we're going to talk a little bit about a new citywide system framework that we want to put in place over the next year. And we've been laying the foundation for that this year with the enterprise architecture tool that you guys funded last year. So over the year, we've been mapping our systems, figuring out how to represent them, diagramming them so that we better understand them in a way that we can look at our portfolio as a whole instead of as its constituent parts. Okay, so that's going to be a big focus. We've also been able to strengthen our cybersecurity posture over the last year. We've put in place endpoint protection. So all of those systems that I mentioned, those are vulnerable places, right, for, for bad actors to come into our system. So we've been strengthening all of the endpoint protection we have in place. We've improved our web filtering mechanisms to enable people working from home to better access and more safely access services and their computers. Um, we've also been working to support the airport with TSA. Um, TSA just recently updated their cyber posture, um, or excuse me, their cyber um, mandate this year. So we've been supporting the airport with that. And finally, we do and have been improving our vulnerability testing so that we can identify and remediate risks before they hit us. So that's what we've been doing along with cybersecurity. Um, that covers what we've been doing internally to support our departments. But now let's look outwards. We were able to, through your support, complete our digital access study this past year. And we learned fascinating things to include that 10% of Idahoans and also our city residents do not have a device to use at home. Do you wanna know how is easy it is to access government services on your cell phone? It's not easy. How might we improve device ownership in our county, in our city, in our state? We have the um, opportunity here now with the data that we've been provided over this digital access study to really look and develop our digital access program in the city, in the county, in our region over the next bit. So thank you for your investment in that study. We now have the data required to help develop a better plan and programming. We've been able to put in place um, the Connect Our Parks program. By fall, we expect we'll have three parks wired with Wi-Fi. This improves the access of the people in those parks. If they don't have a data plan, if they're going from hotspot to hotspot, they will be connected and safe in our parks. So um, those will be installed at um, Cecil Andrus, Julia Davis, and Ann Morrison by the fall. We've also been able to improve connectivity for the pools as well as Veterans Memorial. Um, furthermore, we've worked with our county. This is all in partnership with our county. We've worked with our county to come up with a middle mile plan. This would install and apply for federal funding. We have not yet heard whether or not we've received that federal funding. But this middle mile plan would allow for us to not only connect our anchor institutions, our government with our own fiber, but be able to lease that out um, to new internet service providers and incentivize new internet service providers to come to our county, to come to our town, which will then in turn decrease prices for our constituents. So these are the kinds of things we're doing both internally to IT um, in support of the city and its services and our constituency, and then in turn to support digital access for our public. 
this is what I'm talking about, the new enterprise approach, okay? Historically, we've managed technology, as I mentioned, along the verticals or the departments. We're now starting to look at, if we were to look at this huge portfolio of technology solutions and applications and processes enabled by that across these horizontal lines, community member experience, asset management, resource planning, et cetera, how would it have us look at these things differently? So that's what we're exploring now and prioritizing with. Um, and I'd ask you to kind of to look at that orange middle one, because that's going to be a big emphasis item over the next year. Resource planning. We have an enterprise resource planning tool called Lawson that's aging out. It's also not configured to meet the needs of our growing city. So over the next year, we intend to do ERP planning um, in partnership with finance, HR, and the entire city, because this isn't just an HR and a finance thing. It's a city thing. Um, improving our ability to manage our resources will help us manage our people and money, create efficiencies, provide better business intelligence, both for running the business of the city, but also having ready access to the information that will improve public transparency about how we manage our people and money. So hugely important for the growing city that we have. Today's systems are not adequate for tomorrow's problems. Then again, talking about the digital access piece we're so excited about. Um, we've kind of informally gotten together with our partners over the last year. Um, you heard me talk about this for the first time last January. Over this next year, as we learn whether or not we got the middle mile fund from the, um, the federal government, um, as we start looking at how might we solve these problems that, you know, with a regional approach, we look to establishing and formalizing our digital access coalition in the region. Furthermore, state is actively coming up with a digital access for Idahoans plan with the um, Idaho Commission for Libraries. So we're participating and helping out with that. We know that we have the tools and um, the people power to address low income connectivity and device gaps. We intend to work together for that, not just on the IT side, this is kind of a collective goal. And then finally, we know that we have barriers to remove in terms of improving the actual infrastructure around the internet in our county and city. So we'll advocate for faster, more affordable internet service options and the policy changes required to improve what is now considered our fifth utility. So to wrap it up, looking forward for FY24, we intend to focus on the citywide technology approach, citywide system approach. We wanna to continue to and um, ever improve exceptional internal to support, internal support rather, to power awesome community services. We intend to look at our technology portfolio as a whole and consider how we might modernize it, consolidate it, and migrate it to more modern platforms. Today, there's a heavy, heavy amount of our data and systems that are on-premise. A lot of our vendors are forcing us to move or you know, building new technologies in the cloud. And so with all of the on-prem systems and moving to the cloud, we have to figure out how do we do that over time? We can't just be surprised by it. We have to come up with an action plan and that gets to our citywide approach as well. So we know we're never gonna all move to the cloud with all of our stuff. We don't want to, we don't need to, but we do have to figure out what stuff needs to um, in order to modernize and move with the vendors. And then finally, as was mentioned by the chief of staff earlier, we look to expand our, our data quality and access over the next year. Um, we're asking for investments in the tool set and some staff augmentation to help us um, make our data a little more structured, a little more accessible, particularly to those employees that every day um, are working from home or going between city facilities and home facilities. Right now, a lot of it is wired and accessible more um, effectively from city facilities. That's changed with COVID. We need to also in turn change. So these are the investments we're requesting over the next year and where we intend to take technology as a city. I'll stand for questions. Yes. Um, thank you, Alex. I really appreciate that um, focus on how our hybrid workforce 
functions from home because even in the office of city council you know sometimes i'll ask amanda for something and she's like i can't get that to you till i'm back at city hall um so that'll be really nice i think for all departments to be able to really take advantage of some of the opportunities to work from home and um, still being able to do the full scope of their work while they're doing that. So thank you, really appreciate you. it. Madam Mayor, thank you very much for your presentation. As I said before, I appreciate the focus, um, both from a cybersecurity standpoint and looking at the many, many, many apps and applications that um, many different departments may have and being able to streamline that both to protect us um, from, uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, but also from a cost standpoint as well. So I appreciate your focus on that. Thank you, Council Member. All right, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Next up, we've got Carrie with Human Resources. Welcome, Carrie. Carrie is subbing for the Department Director, Sarah Borden, who is at a child's college graduation this week. Well, thank you and good morning. My name is Carrie Hall. I'm with Human Resources and I'm our Senior Manager for our Human Resources Business Partners. I'm excited to be with you here today to talk about people. So let's show some of those faces. So in Human Resources, our job is truly to serve the people that work here so that they then can provide the services to our community that they rely on us for. We look at serving our employees through the entire employee life cycle from the moment they decide, hey, I think I would like to work at the city of Boise and they become an applicant all the way through and including retirement. So there's many places along the way that we provide that service. And by we, I'm talking about this human resources team. This talented team of public servants comes each day to provide service to our community and to the people that work here. And we do that through eight different divisions from total rewards, employee relations, security services, organizational development, risk and safety, administration, talent acquisition, and the business partners. So it's really this full cycle service that we are providing to everyone who works here. So ultimately we can serve the community. And about a year ago, Sarah Borden stood right here and asked for some major investments in human resources. Human resources had been supporting this organization through times of great growth, both in the community and at the organization level. And we hadn't been really keeping up with that growth. So we stood here and said, can we have some support? And graciously, you said yes. So I want to talk a little bit about what that looked like. And as has been pointed out in a couple presentations before when the work that we do is really through the lens of people, process, and technology. So those investments in FY23 were very heavy around the people side of things. So I want to highlight some of those right now. Um, two weeks ago, Sarah Borden came to you and spoke a little bit about the talent acquisition team and the work that they're redoing, they've been doing. Uh, but this is one of the investments that was made. We were able to reorganize um, what was called employment services into talent acquisition. This allowed us to bring some much needed skill and experience to address the needs of a growing organization and also the changing labor market that we've had. And it allowed us to take some work into HR to free up non-HR staff to focus on providing services and programs to our community. Another people investment, and this is one that's very near and dear to my heart because it's the area that I work in, um, is we were able to stand up a new division within human resources, and those are our business partners. And these folks partner with our departments on people strategy. So they come alongside our department leadership to really understand what the business operation needs are and to ensure that the people strategy is matching that. They serve as a single point of contact for a department's HR needs, and they provide that personal touch to folks who are trying to navigate HR services and processes, which often can be quite complex and even a little intimidating. And then the final people investment was around our security services team. With their investment, we were able to provide additional support for our library patrons and staff at both the main library and our branch libraries. And we added the city hall ambassador information desk down on the first floor that many of you may have walked past today as you came in. From a process side of things, we've made some um, investments and had some impacts this year. One is around recruitment. So we talked about that talent acquisition team. We've also redesigned the function of recruitment to ensure that we are sourcing talent for our growing organization. We've done um, some streamlining on our background checks. And Sarah spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. We brought in a vendor partner to assist with that, all with the idea of we want to decrease the amount of time it takes from offering someone a position to getting them into the role. So help to reduce those vacancies even faster. 
And the final one is around reference checks. And that's work that we're um, hoping to roll out this summer, how we can improve the process of gathering that relevant information that we need to make an informed decision and then decrease the amount of time it takes from that kind of final interview to when we can offer a candidate a position. So fiscal year 23 was really focused on people investments. As we move into 24, it will be kind of leveraging those impacts that we've already been able to make and those investments that were done on process. And then as Alex Winkler spoke about technology readiness as we get ready to the future for technology impl implementation. So for fiscal year 2024, um, the investments that we were hoping to gain are in insurance support. This was a need that was identified across the city for many departments. It would support the city's real estate portfolio and ensure proper insurance coverage for all city facilities and properties. Uh, it would provide analytics and decision points for all lines of insurance and provide support for insurance claims. We look to continue our process improvement efforts and employee experience, starting first with the applicant experience, looking at our application process through the, light, the eyes of the people who are applying for positions. How do we make it accessible, transparent, easy for people to navigate? We know how important it is for people to feel that sense of belonging when they join a new workplace. That starts with our new employee orientation and onboarding experience. So our team in organizational development is really looking at our orientation experience and how to improve that. Um, we are working on that actively right now with implementation in the coming months into early fiscal year 2024. And then finally, from the employee experience standpoint, it's leadership development. We know that by investing in our leaders, we can ensure a workplace where individuals can invest in themselves, find a place where they belong, and ultimately serve this community. So this is a pilot program that has been running this past year. Again, our organizational development team, sorry, I still have it here. Um, organizational development team is working on this. They're making some enhancements to that. We hope to roll that out citywide in fiscal year 2024. And then the final area that um, Alex Winkler spoke about is getting ready for technology implementation. So we have an enterprise resource planning system that is aging out. We want to ensure that we are ready for the implementation when it comes time. So we will be looking at our processes, ensuring those are mapped, and then working with the people so that the change management piece is in place. So when it's time to implement, we are ready. So with that, I just want to say thank you for the investments that you have made in the people that work here and in our community. And I'm happy to stand for any questions. Enemy. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I've had some fabulous experiences recently, especially with the uh, members of the new recruitment team. Really just wonderful, wonderful people who really know their stuff. And um, I've been able to earn a, or to learn a lot. So I really appreciate the great impact of that investment. I have a question about insurance support. This doesn't on its face seem like something that would be housed in HR. Um, oh, to have question. insurance for facilities. So I'm just kind of curious about why, why that's housed in HR instead of like administration or public works or something like that. So maybe you can shed a little light on that. I think I'm actually going to let Christine Miller come up since she smiled at me and answer this question. Good morning, Madam Mayor, members of the council, Christine Miller, Deputy Chief of Staff. Um, I think this is a funny historical structural thing. Um, so the risk and safety team sits in human resources. Um, you may all know or remember Corey Pence. And so um, this due to its, its nature and risk and safety resides in that team. And so as we were trying to figure out, um, because our facilities team sits in public works, the risk and safety team sits in HR, um, our uh, real estate manager sits in the mayor's office. We're like, okay, where, where does this best sit? Um, and Corey Pence very kindly offered to take it since he does um, shepherd the city's overall insurance risk and safety portfolio. But know that those teams are working really closely together um, through kind of dotted line reporting structures, even though they formally sit in different departments. Thank you for that. And I am ashamed to say that I didn't even realize that Corey Pence worked in HR. There you go. <laughs> like I thought that he worked for DFA or something. So that is new information to me. Really fascinating. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Madam Mayor, um, thanks so much for highlighting, you know, all the, the work and the, 
the investment in in people have paid off. I'm a firm believer that the HR has like kind of a multiplier effect because you can help people with all the things that they don't have expertise in. And I know that last year we even had some positions um, to help out the library that really helped our librarians be librarians and not have to uh, deal with some of the security and the other challenging things you know that librarians aren't have the same level of expertise with. Um, I was really excited and interested to learn maybe just a little bit more about um, what you meant as far as investing in leadership development, because I think that that's such an important thing as well. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk to that just a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, Mayor, council member, that's a great question. I'm happy to speak to it a little bit and also happy to um, follow up a little bit with our organizational development team. But um, the organizational development team has been working on a kind of a five part course that they are taking our supervisors and leaders through that um, our team in public works actually piloted that this year and has been able to provide some feedback and it kind of covers everything that you would think of from how to be a leader and how to manage folks um, in an organization so it is really important for us that we roll that out citywide um, we got great feedback from our public works team and we're able to use that to kind of morph it and make it even better um, so that all of our leaders can go through that in the next year yeah that's such a great answer so that's like the example of the multiplier effect um, that you all are so great with so thanks for all the hard work thanks, thanks gary thank you all right, now we've got Linda. Welcome, Linda, with Finance and Administration, DFA. Thank you very and much. And then we will go ahead. We're running a little ahead of the schedule now. So, Doug, you're on, you will be on deck. Well, I think Parks was first after lunch. We'll do that before lunch. We might take one more as well. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Um, good morning. My name is Linda Lowry, and I am the Director of Finance and Administration. Um, as a quick refresher, uh, in DFA, we support the city and departments in four main areas, finance, city clerk, code enforcement, and fleet services. Um, finance, in the area of finance, we support in our city departments with budget, accounting, treasury, purchasing, um, financial services to the departments such as budget development, financial reporting, analytics, accounts payable, accounts receivable, and grants management. Uh, the city clerk's office provides a community with business licensing, animal licensing, payment services and general customer service, as well as special event permitting, legislative and election support, records management and print and mail services. And um, code enforcement provides citywide enforcement for zoning and civil code uh, enforcement and case management, parking enforcement, animal enforcement. And last but not least, uh, Fleet Services is also a part of DFA and they provide citywide vehicle maintenance, repair and acquisition services to all city departments. So thanks to your support and your investment in DFA and FY23, we were able to accomplish a lot of objectives. The first being stabilizing our work. Um, we added additional resources in the clerk's office on the front counter. We're experiencing a lot of turnover in that area. And so the additional resources were allowed us to stabilize the work there, get fully staffed, proud to say right now. And um, with that, hopefully we'll be able to add um, consistent service levels and um, reduce um, turnover in general. And um, we, that has also enabled uh, the city clerk's office to expand our hours one evening a week to enable childcare and other workers to fulfill their fingerprint requirements uh, after work instead of during the business hours. In finance, um, you, you uh, provided additional resources to help support our departments. You heard earlier, the airport, public works, planning and development services, how they're embarking on a lot of very strategic uh, community facing priorities. And so we needed more financial support to help support them in the work that they do. And in addition, um, we also were able to document a lot of our processes and procedures. We're currently doing that as well across DFA so that as we have new employees and as we have turnover, they can get on board efficiently and get up to speed quickly so that we can maintain continuity of services to the community and to our departments. Um, this past year, we've also finalized a reorg, a finan uh, sorry, an organizational assessment in DFA. And um, with that, we've developed a new organizational structure that will meet the needs of a growing city. And I will go into more of that. And lastly, uh, technology is always an important enabler of any good organization. And as you've heard from my colleague, Alex Winkler, uh, in IT, we've been investing a lot of time and resources in preparing for the future implementation of a new enterprise resource. Uh, planning tool. And um, we've uh, 
developed an RFP. We have an RFP ready that has um, we've worked really hard on with IT and HR and our finance staff to build all the requirements for what a future system, um, an ideal system will look like to meet our requirements and our needs here at the city. Um, lastly, in the meantime, in FY23, we have been investing in um, strengthening our reporting, financial reporting to departments and the capabilities um, for our partners in our departments to review financial information. We're partnering with IT develops to develop some easy to use accessible financial and HR reports and dashboards so that managers across the city have access to detailed data at their fingertips to make quicker, more data-driven decisions. Um, in FY24, uh, the investments we plan to make are, will continue to, continue to align with maintaining service levels and preparing for the future by supporting parking services so they can continue to maintain, maintain service levels, uh, continuation of funding of our grants team, modernizing finance through our reorganization, as well as um, preparing for our new ERP. Uh, parking services manages approximately 5,000 parking spaces in and around the downtown area. Uh, that includes about 1,300 parking meters and 3,700 uh, non-metered time-regulated areas. Um, these parking options have proven to be a valuable resource uh, to our downtown businesses and workers. Expanded parking options for employees and construction downtown has increased demand for enforcement. Additional resources and parking will help maintain parking turnover and enable our local businesses to thrive and residents to find parking near their homes. As Courtney mentioned, this is one of those investments and those res uh, resource requests that are budget neutral. Um, in the short time that the grants management team has been up and running in DFA, they have done a great job supporting grant related activities across the city. The team has supported important sub-award programs in childcare, small business, mental health, and food security by assisting with program development, grant agreement documentation and execution, grant disbursement, as well as post-award monitoring and compliance. With an eye to the long-term improvements, uh, this, the team is currently uh, working on developing grant policies and procedures, examining functionality of a modern grants software platform, uh, through the RFI process and working with our cognizant federal agent, which is the FAA, on implementing a uh, negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, which will hopefully, hopefully allow the city to cover more of our administrative costs related to grants in the future. The team recently added a grant writer to assist with uh, grant seeking and grant acquisition. Uh, their contribution helped secure a mental health grant for BPD, and they are currently assisting on um, two applications, one for parks and one for library. And then I recently learned last week that they've been requested to assist on three additional grant award opportunities, um, another two for parks and an additional one for library as well. While our finance organization does a good job supporting the day-to-day -day needs of the city and the departments and maintaining strong financial controls to meet the demands of a growing city and fully enable the city to serve the community effectively, now into the future, we need to evolve. Therefore, we are reorganizing finance um, in the division of DFA to enable scalability. Scalability is important as a city grows so that resources can be allocated to advance community prosperity community priorities versus administrative functions. Uh, it's hope, we hope and we plan to uh, reorganize to enable leaders to make more transparent data-driven decisions in real time. The plan is to automate processes for efficiency, to reduce errors, and to reduce manual work and consumption of paper. Uh, and this new structure will also align with the functional work areas typically seen in a new ERP and modern technology solutions, thus allowing us to fully leverage technology and the workflows and the automations that they can provide. And finally, the new structure will improve competency, develop for, competency development for staff, promotional opportunities, provide clear roles and responsibilities for improved collaboration, all of which will enhance job satisf satisfaction and reduce turnover. 
So I want to thank you again for all your uh, continued support of DFA and the investments in, in the Department of Finance and Administration. All these investments in our people, process, and technology all work together to create a modern organization that will meet the needs of a growing city. With that, we'll stand for any questions. Questions for Linda? All right, thank you Great, very thank much. You. Doug, and then I think Jessica, you ought to be ready. Just if, if Doug stays on time, then we'll have time for you too. Madam Mayor, Doug will stay on time. I appreciated noticing that you started pacing as soon as I gave you a warning, but. Had to run to the restroom, Madam Mayor. <laughs> um, Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, Doug Holloway, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, I'm happy it is my pleasure today to uh, give you an update on some of the items that we have, uh, investments and items we've completed in 23 and what we're pro proposing uh, in 24 as well. So from the 23 investment and impact uh, area, um, I'm uh, pleased to announce that both the Grove Trail and the Red Fox Trail, both ex fully accessible improvements in our foothills will be completed by the end of June um, and available to the public. Uh, again, this uh, speaks to the mayor's vision, creating a city for everyone by pr providing accessible trails uh, within the foothills, as well as uh, in an, uh, most of our park sites. The 10 minute walk to a park, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, as you're aware, this is probably our number one initiative uh, in providing a 10 minute walk for all households that are within the city limits uh, of Boise. Um, we are at about 70% of those total households are now within that uh, 10 minute walk distance. And it is uh, the goal that every household uh, within uh, every household within the city limits of Boise be, be within that 10 minute walk. You can see some of the uh, investments that we have uh, made or in the process of making in 2023. Um, those uh, three bullet points would constitute about 2,300 more households that are within that 10 minute walk just in this past year. So we are making uh, significant progress since we've adopted the 10 minute walk, we're about 10 percent uh, more than where we were when we first adopted it. So I think we started somewhere around 60% and we're at 70. The other two key initiatives we have, the America the Beautiful and the Elaine Clegg City of Trees Challenge. Uh, again, uh, happy to report that we're almost at 20% on the America the Beautiful. And if you, uh, just uh, uh, to remind uh, Madam Mayor and Council members, the goal is by 2030 that we will um, be preserving 30% of, of our open space and our water within the city limits of Boise. So um, you have done such an amazing job because when we started this three years ago, we were already at a baseline of 15%. So we have added 5% to that. So we're well on our way to hit that 30% goal by 2030. And then the Elaine Clegg City of Trees Challenge, uh, we're just over 12,000 trees have been planted in the three years that the challenge has, has, uh, has begun. And I believe we're about 1,100 trees so far in uh, 2023 to add to that 12,000. This is a map of those investments that we have made in 2023. Um, and the, what speaks to me with this map uh, very clearly is the demographic, or excuse me, the geographic uh, diversity. If you look, we have investments in North and Northwest Boise. We have the uh, investments in uh, Central Bench, West Bench, and Southwest Boise as well, and over in East Boise, uh, including our downtown uh, regional parks. So when you look at what you are doing, Madam Mayor and Council Members, we are putting um, our finances and our investments all across the city. So um, all our plans in the future are to continue to look uh, at investments all over the city, particularly in that central and west bench area. But I think this does provide a really good picture to our community that um, we are putting investments all over the town. So some of the things we're looking at for 2024, all are related um, to keeping up with growth and keeping up with our commitment with our citizens to provide you know a world-class park and recreation system and that is maintaining really what we have um, and and making sure that that is available in a plus in an a plus status to our customers and so that includes adding some additional resources to our downtown maintenance team it also uh, includes uh, investing in our horticultural division within parks and recreation 
where we can uh, invest more resources in our turf management. Um, obviously, we're having a lot of special events and sports activities that are occurring and will continue to occur and we're going to continue to add those in the community. They're a great engagement opportunity for the community and, and, and pre present a sense of belonging for our citizens. Uh, but we also want to make sure that when those events are, are over with that um, our parks are still maintained in an A-plus uh, manner for just our general use by our general public. So. Uh, investing in in some new innovative programs from a turf maintenance standpoint is going to be important moving into the future. Um, our recreation division is experiencing some significant uh, growth in participation uh, by our citizens, and so we are looking at uh, adding resources uh, to be certain that we're that we're maintaining our vision of providing safe, affordable, and accessible programming in that in that division. And so um, we look at, uh, at the fact that we do need to add some resources there and are proposing that for 2024. So some of the, um, uh, this is just a very small snapshot of some of the major repair and maintenance projects we'll be uh, embarking on in 2024. Um, we will be uh, providing another accessible playground. Uh, this will be at Hewitt Park, which is off of uh, McMillan. It's uh, actually right behind McMillan El Elementary School. Uh, we'll be completing the updated um, uh, pieces to White Park Phase, uh, Whitewater Park Phase Two, when the uh, irrigation season concludes during the winter time, and we can get into the river uh, at lower levels. We're hoping that all that will be completed during that time period. Uh, we're replacing the plastering in both uh, the uh, kiddie pool as well as the major pool at the natatorium, and also replacing the roof. Um, some of the high water levels, we've already uh, seen some erosion in some of the bank and some of the green belt uh, areas along um, some of the key locations where we've had uh, not necessarily flooding, but just some significant uh, high levels in areas that we're going to have to do some repairs uh, during the course of this next year. And we do have a new parking lot and infrastructure improvement that we're, we're proposing at uh, Owyhee Park uh, for this year as well. Uh, road skate park restroom will be adding a, a restroom facility it's very similar if you're if you're familiar with uh, the restroom we have at Shree Buckner Webb it would be a model similar to that and then the goal is to repurpose that restroom into uh, the brick restroom that we have there now into a storage unit that could be used by uh, Boise police could be used by fire across the uh, across the road or our team would would be utilizing that as well. And then we have ongoing uh, pond water in, in uh, partnership with our public works team, uh, pond water testing and mitigation. Um, the work that public works has done, as you all are aware, uh, Madam Mayor and Council members with Quinns and Esther Simplot uh, ponds one and two has been working. Um, those ponds for the second year in a row have been open all summer long. Um, but we also do pond water testing at all of our pond locations to stay ahead of some of the bacteria that can uh, formulate and and cause issues with with fish and a lot of our residents have their pets that uh, dogs that go into the pond so we want to make sure that they're um, that we're staying ahead of the blue green algae outbreak that typically happens during the summertime so we're doing a lot of that and we'll continue to do that and then we uh, invoke certain mitigation, mitig mitigation uh, procedures, again, in cooperation with Public Works to uh, stay ahead of uh, any of the issues we have in our ponds. And with that, Madam Mayor, I would be happy to stand for uh, any questions. Madam Mayor. Um, oh, oh you're, no, you're good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, I was up at Casha Park the other day and love that accessible playground, love the rubber surfacing and how it allows kids of all abilities to play together. Um, and I'm glad to see that happening at Hewitt Park up by McMillan too. That'll be a wonderful, um, wonderful addition to that neighborhood. I mean, all I have to say is keep up the good work. You guys are doing awesome. We have lots of water amenities happening for our residents in anticipation of a hot summer. Um, really excited to run through those this week. And uh, yeah, I mean, go team. You guys are doing great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thanks, Doug. A couple questions for you. I know we've got a dandelion festival coming up. Uh, in one of our parks that kind of relates to some of the different ways we've been maintaining the parks. And I know that this isn't like the hugest budget item in the world, but like, have we been saving? Is there cost savings that we've been done in the way that we've been maintaining, using less herbicides, less pesticides, mowing a little bit less frequently? Um, I know that that was a presentation that we got last year. Uh, yeah, Madam Mayor, uh, 
Council Member Halle Burton, we're definitely seeing seeing a savings that I can get back to you on what we uh, on what we're experiencing there. Um, obviously, using less chemical, um, and we're not mowing as frequently, and so there are some some uh, savings that we are realizing. And I can let you know that, but we do have a dandelion festival coming up um, here soon that we can show you how to do some creative things with dandelions. Yeah, which I think is a great idea because because people always wonder why are there so many dandelions? You're like, because we want them to be there. <laughs> That's why. Um, the other question was, uh, so we've got some major projects that are listed here in the budget, um, but sometimes we have things that can actually expedite some of those projects faster or create new projects faster. Sometimes those are um, foundations jumping in, private donors. Um, I guess what, I, what I'm getting at is that these are the major projects for the year, but if somebody had $12 million that they wanted to donate, and help make some of these projects happen faster or some other projects that we may not have funding for um there could be question mark um the opportunity for some other projects to come online uh, madam mayor uh, council member halley burton um the the short answer is probably yes uh, there also is a capacity issue uh both in terms of what we can do within this even if somebody dropped 12 million into our lap and we could say wow there's some cool things we could do um, it does become a capacity issue, not just in parks and recreation, but we rely on all of our internal service departments as well. And so, um, but that we don't want to discourage that. Donations just, are welcome. We have to, yeah, we have to make sure we, we're capable of, of pulling off something that a, that a generous donor would provide us funding for. Perfect. Madam Mayor, Doug, thanks for the presentation. Great information. I'm obviously very excited about the possibility of the development of the Shamrock Park. One of the things that we've talked about at the council is the idea of the 10 minute walk, which I think is fantastic. And it's something that I think the citizens would obviously enjoy. When we looked at that map a few months ago, as I recall, it included freeway. So in other words, if the 10 minute walk had, if you were on the other side of the freeway, you would count the park on the other side of the freeway. And I wanna make sure that as we look at this, that it's not only a 10 minute walk on paper, but it's practical. So as we look at this and as we look to develop, I think that's an area we need to consider. Um, and it's so it's more of a comment than anything. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, mm -hmm. um, recalling that conversation that we had, because I remember that too, I believe that park staff said that they did account for that for freeway um, and that the walk was um, only on that side of the freeway and it didn't, it did take that um, geography into account. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members, I do believe that is correct. Um, we use a national uh, software that only takes into account the actual sidewalk and any pathway connection that gets you within that 10 minute walk. So if a freeway is there, then that's a barrier to that okay. pathway. So I believe that that is uh, correct. All right, thank you very much, Doug. Great, thank you, Mayor. Great. All right, we'll take one more. Jessica, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Doug and I planned for keeping you awake after lunch. We really appreciate this opportunity uh, to be succinct so that we don't keep you from lunch. Um, um, my name is Jessica Dore. I have the honor of being the director of the Boise Public Library. That means I'm a I am a librarian. I am not an engineer. I'm not a construction manager. I'm not a roofer, but I would like you to imagine me with a construction hat on because the theme for this year and next for the library is Boise Public Library under construction and open for business. And I want to talk about under construction both figuratively in terms of where we are with our strategic planning process, but then literally as this photo uh, from the front of our downtown building shows you. <laughs> we have in the last uh, couple weeks created three new holes in the downtown facility because we are getting ready to install an automated book sorter. So here is a picture of what used to be our front window. Uh, it is now a plywood, uh, double plywood uh, piece because this is where the actual sorter will go and this is where people will now be able to put their books into and have them sorted so why is this investment so important for the library and so important for the citizens of boise with an automated book sorter so think about 
a smaller version of when you go to the airport and put in your luggage and it automatically sorts for you. We'll be doing that with books. That brings us two things. Number one, you'll get your materials faster. Stuff gets turned in, it gets, it gets sorted, it gets to a new reader faster. But more importantly, it's going to free up a lot of our staff time for engaging with the public. So that means we can answer more questions. That means we can get people signed up for library cards faster. That means that people are going to be helped faster and with more of our staff time. But the sorter is not the only place where we're using FY23 investments to make sure that Boise has access to materials. Um, we've been able to complete our archive of the Idaho Statesman. So we now have continual access to one of our most used resources, uh, digital resources. It goes all the way back now to July 28th, 1864, which is 30 years before the first library was actually founded in Boise. Um, but we've been able to complete that. Uh, and then we also were able to, refer, uh, with the additional funding for materials, we had a focus on our, uh, our youth materials this year, and we're able to refresh our children's collections at every single location, uh, which are some of the materials that uh, circulate the most. Um, and we also made an investment in some um, read-along picture books, which are a really important tool for early literacy. Under construction also applies to our website, uh, where we're working with our partners in IT and CE to update our website both with uh, advanced search but a more stable platform um, since so many people access the library through uh, the internet. Uh, and then our other branches are benefiting from under construction. We will have this year new flooring at Colin Eustick and Hillcrest, new paint at Colin Eustick, upgraded AV equipment, and new shelving at Collister and Hillcrest. So people who go into their local or nearest library will see improvements, they'll see that space. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, we really appreciate the partnership that we've had with HR in terms of the uh, additional security. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody has a safe and welcoming environment, and we wanna make sure that we're safe for staff and the public. Uh, and then another investment uh, that you uh, helped us with was adding the mental health coordinator to our staff. We've got that position has been almost filled for a year, and that person has been able to help hundreds of Boiseans um, with access to housing, access to resources, um, and really, you know, food uh, insecurity issues are better, better, better addressed at a library, uh, and some of the, you know, more intensive uh, support services are able to work with us better. Uh, and then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the support that you provided that's helped us expand our summer reading program again. We had our uh, summer reading and learning celebration this Saturday. On Thursday, every location will have a party. Um, so please come and make sure uh, that you check that out and get signed up. We have summer reading for people of all ages. Uh, we have 9,000 books um, that people can earn throughout the program. Um, and we've been able to add an interns uh, that will help us with outreach, um, particular to those students that were impacted by the pandemic. One of my favorite construction projects this year is the one that we have that has been to create our new strategic plan. Uh, and we're very close to having this approved by the Library Board of Trustees. This will be a five-year plan, um, and we're looking forward to really sharing with you more of the details um, and, and the public as well. Through our engagement with the community, through our survey, through our listening sessions, uh, through our programs, we identified, identified four strategic priority areas that will shape the work of the library for the next five years. And this will, these will really ensure that we are meeting the needs of the people of Boise. Um, we're gonna expand access. That means making our collections, programs, and services available when, where, and how people want them. We're going to increase our impact, create valuable experiences for every resident and meet their needs at every stage of life. We're gonna modernize, strengthen, and streamline our operational capabilities that will help us optimize our resources. And we're gonna measure our value. We're gonna establish impact and performance metrics and use that data for decision-making. So what does this look like in FY24? Uh, we've got investments that'll fill in um, and start some of that building blocks um, for the strategic plan as we move into it. 
you will see uh, an expanded collection for us. And we're really excited about this. This will allow us to make sure that every community member has access to library materials in a format that works for them. Um, we are one of the first public libraries in the United States that has taken advantage of a work of the Library of Congress, and we're um, actually working with three regional language centers to bring in materials uh, that are published in local languages so that the 10% of our Boisean households um, that speak a language other than English will, will start to have collections that are in the languages um, uh, that they're familiar with and that are done by publishers that would be from uh, their country of origin. Um, and we're also going to add to our e-audio books um, with the purchases of some books with a one copy, one use. This will give us perpetual access as publishers are increasingly moving to a lease model, uh, which, as you know, is more expensive and doesn't allow us to grow our collections. Um, and then we're also really excited about creating uh, library spaces that are accessible and welcoming to all. Now that we have, you know, we're nearing the end of our strategic planning process and we know what the city of Boise wants in terms of usage, we'll be able to kick off a facilities planning process. It's been 20 years since the library did facilities planning. A lot has changed since then in terms of Boise, but also in terms of library technology. Um, and we know that with that in place, um, and particularly if the modern zoning code passes, that will also help us really understand how people move around Boise, um, where they'll grow. And this, I think, will be the great piece for us to then really dig into what what, what's a facilities plan look like for our libraries now and in the future? We're also going to continue to expand our efforts around programming. Um, one of the things we heard is uh, a real appreciation for early literacy and how much we do with that, but also adding adult um, programming. So we'll see that um, next year as well. Um, and then finally, we're adding capacity in uh, access to um, data in terms of our analysis. As a profession, we collect a lot of data, how people use our website, how people use our facilities, how people uh, use our materials. We don't have capacity right now to really take advantage of that. And I think having additional capacity in um, how we are collecting our metrics, analyzing that data, and how we're making decisions on it is really going to be, um, for us, just a true mechanism for making sure that we are continually meeting the needs of Boiseans as Boise continues to grow and change. And with that, I will stand for questions or compliments for my staff as well. <laughs> Madam. Well Jessica, you know that I have a million compliments for you and your staff um, all the time. I think that you really provide an important resource to our community, and you do so in a way that always feels welcoming in every library I go to. Um, so I really appreciate that. I just wanted to expand a little bit on the... So I think when you first came in, I was like, where's this facilities plan? When are we going to do this? Um, which I think is really important, but then you kind of described how we were going to do a strategic plan first. Um, can you describe to me a little bit how the public will be involved, how they were involved in the strategic plan, and then how they will be also involved in an upcoming facilities plan? Uh, Mary, Council Member Winnings, thank you for the question. Uh, I will... I will go back a little bit with that because when we made the decision to really focus the strategic plan on programs and services, we did it during a real time of change in how Boise was using our library because of the pandemic. You know, that was where we just saw some really significant shifts in terms of, you know, our for the first time ever, our digital resources were more than our physical resources. We wanted to see would that go back. Um, particularly for that youth that should really be using, that uses print more than digital. We had curbside, we had grab and goes, we just had so much change going on. It was hard to know sort of would it, was it a trend that was going to keep going? Was it a trend that was going to reset? And so it was so important to us that we really focused on, okay, what are, what are the programs and services that the community wants? While we did that, we had so much feedback about the facilities, more than I expected, um, to be 
quite honest, we had not, as you might remember from the last time I was talking about this, 9,000 open-ended uh, questions or 9,000 answers on our open-ended questions. And going through that, people wanted to talk about safe, welcoming facilities, what that building, what those buildings would look like, how they would fit into. So this is where we know, yes, absolutely. We need to do that work with the community and we need to do a similar process that we did to the strategic plan where we have opportunities um, at locations, uh, through surveys, through focus groups. Um, we want to make sure that we have community input because we heard how valuable that is and how much people in Boise wants to participate in it. Just have one follow up. Sure. How will that, um, how will our kind of more regional library system figure into that facility plan um, as you're figuring out what that looks like? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Woodings, are you referring to the consortium libraries or I'm not sure what you mean? Yeah, so kind okay. of the consortium libraries, you know, say um, the close in part of Northwest Boise might have closer access to the Garden City Library. Like how does that figure into facility planning? <laughs> Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Woodings, I don't know the answer to that yet, and we will find out because it is an interesting, you know, as we are in uh, Boise and as the uh, library systems around us are looking at investments as well, we have a great opportunity to speak with the leadership um, of those libraries and really think about how we're working collaboratively because um, the Lynx Consortium has provided such great benefit to all participating libraries. You know, you can put a book on reserve on your phone. You can go get it at your library. You have no idea where it comes from. You could drop it off at any location. It really is such an asset um, to every library user uh, in the Treasure Valley. And so there is a real opportunity for us to think um, about about what a city and what a library in Boise does, but also how we're really supporting the consortium or engaged with the consortium as well. Madam Mayor, thank you again for your presentation. I'm just curious um, on your last bullet here in terms of measuring value. Can you give me just a little bit more insight about how you intend to go about measuring that value? Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Haney Keith, I love that question. Thank you for asking it. The library profession is very good at statistics and counts. How many people come into each location? Um, you know, how fast does a book circulate? Where I am excited about the profession moving is the value of the impact of what that means for a user, um, particularly around, you know, if we've got a program that is focused on um, economic development, how many people were able to you know, update their resume? How many people were you know, able to do a job interview in our library, did that help them actually get employment? We really want to start thinking about how can we measure outcomes? Um, we need to start with some of the just like, you know, how do we make sure that we're really focused on, you know, being as efficient as possible. But the whole point is to provide people with information that allows them to improve their lives. We want to be measuring that improvement. And Mary. Um, Thanks for the presentation. I'm so excited to see the strategic plan um, in kind of its final form and how that can help guide our decisions. And I really appreciate all the work that's gone into that, both from you, the staff, um, and certainly the public, because the public was hugely engaged in that process and it was really, really impressive. Um, and I'm also impressed. I know that you know the, the last few years have been challenging because we haven't always wanted to invest a lot of funds into that downtown library, not knowing what the future has gonna be with it. And I think that that's been challenging for the public coming in and actually using it and then really challenging for the staff, um, knowing that you've got a building that has some issues that you can't uh, address or you don't know how to address because you don't know what the future is. I'm glad to see that, we, um, that we're making and we've made those investments. And I think that'll have a big impact on 20, uh, 24. Um, one thing, you know, I have the, the privilege of being the council liaison to the library. And I, I think in February, there was a business value calculator um, report that we got. And I believe it was $1.2 million in value um, that the library has contributed um, in that business value calculator. And I thought that was a, an underestimate because it was sort of, those were just the things that you could measure. And so I'm excited to see uh, sort of that continued um, 
pursuit of measuring that value, whether it's how our collections are being used, some of them at 97% throughout the year, um, how they can be expanded, how we can measure those kind of, you know, those values as far as creating, um, you know, business and economic development in the city. And it really is impressive to see how um, dedicated your staff has been to using that data for the strategic plan for some of this decision making. So no question, just a bunch of compliments. Um, I appreciate that. And, and I hope that, um, you know, if there is ever an opportunity to present some of that, that data or those reports, that business calculator one, I think is extremely interesting and something that both the council and the public would love to see. Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Halley Burton, thank you for mentioning that. We will make sure to bring that back for the full council. All right. Thank you so much. We are going to break for lunch. We'll be back at noon.